Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's hearing of the New York City Council of Transportation Committee. I'm Idani Rodriguez, chair of the committee, and I'm joined by my colleagues, uh, the chairman of the, of, uh, of the aging committee, Margaret Chain, Councilmember Cohen, Ballon, Crowley. Uh, we are gathered today to discuss the importance issue of improving transportation for the disabled and elderly community through the access, a ride, and other programs. Transportation is often something that we as New Yorkers take for granted. But some in our city have limited options and struggle every day to get from point A to point B. For this reason, we must work toward making significant improvements now that will allow for better condition in the future. According to the United States Census, over 850,000 New Yorkers have disability and without accessible transit options can be kept from jobs, social lives, parks, and all that our city has to offer. With the passage of the United States Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990, our city began working to ensure comparable transit options exist for all those who face disabilities. Through this, the Access a Ride program was created, which now operates under the auspices of the MTA, providing ride, ride, rides for disabled persons through various independent uh, subcontractors. We appreciate the MTA's commitment to providing paratransit services and for recognizing the importance of this service through the creation of the paratransit division. Yet, through conversations with constituency and advocacy organizations, it remains clear that there is a real need for improvement in transportation for those New Yorkers. Concerns relating to late service, unsafe driving, and a lack of accountability are all of interest to this committee as some of our most vulnerable residents are placed at risk when these issues persist. Additionally, no shows which have the potential to leave people stranded with no way to get home or their destination are entirely unacceptable. MTA data shows that the percentage of trips where this occurs is on the rise and we cannot stand for this. While budget constraints remain a reality, this is not an excuse for failing to provide service for those in real need. Tarrant eligibility requirements have left many ones receiving these valuable services to look elsewhere at greater costs, both physically and financially. On top of that, a lack of, trans of translation service has limited access to this essential resource to many communities throughout our city. Strategies that can keep costs down but still provide service to, uh, to and expand numbers of individuals in need must be explored. Therefore, we are eager to hear what the MTA has planned as well as the most recent status update on the Zero Fare Metro Car Program in partnership with the TLC licensed vehicles through the taxi debit card programs. As the city moves to, uh, toward greater accessibility in its taxi and, and for higher vehicle fleet and a stricter enforcement of traffic violations, this is an era where we can realize real benefits at lower costs while providing safe, affordable, and timely services for disabled persons. Not all New Yorkers have the luxury of taking a subway or bus on their daily commutes, but this does not mean we can allow them go undeserved. It is not only compassionate and equitable to provide transportation services to disabled persons, but it is federal law. As such, we must diligently explore every avenue available to improve trans trans uh, paratransit services. 
we must continue to modernize our existing transit infrastructure, making more subway stations accessible and providing greater accommodation, accommodation on our buses. But we must also improve access, a ride, and comparable services to bring them up to par in providing truly equitable transportation for those in greater need. I would like, I would like to thank my committee staff, Council Kelly Taylor, Policy Analyst, Jonathan Mazzareno, Kafar, Salov, and Rosa Murphy, as well as my chief of staff, Carmen de la Rosa, and my community, communication and legislative director, Lucas Acosta, for helping me so much, preparing me for this hearing. Now I would like to call my co-chairs, Council Member Chin and Cohen, to also do the opening statement. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez. Good morning. I am Council Member Margaret Chin, Chair of the Committee on Aging. We are very pleased to be joined today by my colleagues, Council Member Andrew Cohen, Chair of the Committee on Mental Health, Council Member Idanas Rodriguez, Chair of the Committee on Transportation, and members of the Mental Health and Transportation Committees. I would like to acknowledge Council Member Malone and Council Member Koskowitz of the Aging Committee who are with us today. Today, we will be having an important conversation about how our seniors and people with disabilities are able to access our city. For many older New Yorkers and others with disabilities, New York City's paratransit system, Accessori, is a vital lifeline to assessing medical services, social and cultural activities, and other daily needs. <coughs> According to the Department for the Aging, disability rates are higher for older New Yorkers when compared with the national population. In one study reported by DIFTA, 37% of seniors reported some level of disability and one-fifth of senior, 20%, had conditions which restrict their ability to leave their home, shop, or visit the doctor. In a city of almost 1.5 million seniors and growing, there is a significant number of people who may be able to benefit from accessory services because they cannot access the city's mass transit system. As the seniors with disabilities also report higher level of poverty and social isolation, it is essential that they be provided with the affordable, accessible means of transportation to which they are entitled to by law. Unfortunately, Accessorite does not always provide the services those seniors and others with disabilities need. Seniors and other Accessorite customers have complaints for many years about drivers eating, either arriving late for their appointed time or simply not showing up at all. When such trips, as they often do, involve critical medical appointments, such issues are not only unacceptable customer service, but potentially harmful to the individual relying on accessory to get them to their appointments. Limited English proficiency people with disability have also complained about barriers to accessory due to the lack of language accessibility provided by the MTA. My staff recently conducted a survey of seniors in my district who reported a wide range of experience using Accessori. Most seniors in my district use Accessori for doctor's visit and trip to senior centers. We heard about issues with language access, trip length, and poor coordination with passengers, and most significantly, punctuality, with seniors often being delivered up to an hour late for appointments. New York City's population of people with disability, seniors and non-seniors, deserve better. We would like to hear from the MTA about how they have addressed these concerns and how they will work in the future to ensure that these individuals get safe, effective, and affordable service that enable them to participate more fully in the daily life of the city. Additionally, we will hear from DIFTA about its transportation services program, which currently makes about 250,000 trips per year 
for seniors unable to access or use public transportation. DIFTA has put out a concept paper for a planned RFP to expand this program. And we look forward to exploring DIFTA's goal for increasing access to safe, reliable transportation for seniors in New York City. I thank both the MTA and DIFTA and of course our advocates for joining us today. And I also want to thank our um, committee staff, Eric Bernstein, our counsel, James Sabuti, policy analyst, and Dohini Sapura, financial, finance analyst, and my chief of staff, Yume Kitase, for helping to prepare for this hearing. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to recognize Council Member Konstantinidis, Menchaka, Kozluis, and Dutch, Dutch, and now from the Mental Health Committee, uh, the Chairman of that Committee, Council Member Cohen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Andrew Cohen, and I'm the Chair of the Council's Committee on Mental Health, Developmental Disabilities, Alcoholism, Drug Abuse, and Disability Services. Uh, I am pleased to be joined by my colleagues Margaret Chin, Chair of the Committee on Aging, and Yudanis Rodriguez, Chair of the Committee on Transportation, with whom I am co-chairing this hearing. Without accessible transportation, persons with disabilities are effectively shut out from being part of mainstream life in New York City. Many thousands of New Yorkers have physical disabilities that affect their walking, climbing stairs, reaching, lifting, and carrying, and also have many conditions which, which restrict their ability to go outside, shop, or visit their doctors. An important factor which cannot be discounted is the social, social isolation that results from such disability severely limits the very quality of life these New Yorkers and all New Yorkers deserve. Oops, so Daisy. The Americans with Disabilities Act was signed into law on July 26, 1990. It was a groundbreaking piece of legislation and it, it is to be celebrated as we embark upon its 25th uh, anniversary year. The ADA requires reasonable accommodations to make public transportation services available to all, abled and disabled. Today's hearing will examine whether the ADA's intent and requirements are being met and to determine whether the members of the disabled community are in fact receiving a comparable level of service. We have serious due process concerns about both the initial eligibility determinations and the, and the review upon appeal. For those determined eligible, we are concerned with reports, reported wait times and the availability of services. The city and state has a huge investment in our transportation system. Hundreds of millions of dollars are spent on accessoride program and New York City Transit Power and New York City's Power Transit Division, which is why we need to hear from the administrators of, this pro of these programs and the consumers of these services so that the committee may, in an informed fashion, determine whether the ADA requirements are being met. Thank you. Uh, the Committee on Mental Health and Development of Disabilities Services is also voting today on Resolution 638, which establishes April as Autism Awareness Month in the City of New York. Briefly, autism and autism spectrum disorder refers to a group of complex disorders of brain development and although the exact causes of these abnormalities remain unknown, this is a very active area of research. These disorders are characterized in varying degrees by difficulties in social interaction, verbal and nonverbal communications, and repetitive behaviors. The United Nations established World Autism Awareness Day in 2007, observed on April 2nd every year since 2008. Observance of World Autism Awareness Day occurs yearly in April throughout the United States, including Chicago, Atlanta, and Los Angeles. I am proud to be a co-sponsor of this resolution establishing Autism Awareness Month in the city, New York City. I would also like to acknowledge Kimberly Williams, Committee Counsel, Michael, Benjam, Michael Benjamin, Legislative Policy Analyst, and Krillian Francisco, Financial Analyst, for their hard work in preparing for today's hearing. I want to thank Council Member Ulrich for sponsoring this resolution, uh, and I urge my colleagues to vote yes on 638. Uh, I'd also just like to acknowledge that we've been joined by members of the Committee on Mental Health, Councilwoman Crowley and Councilmember Malone. Thank you. Oh, and I would uh, ask the clerk to call the roll. William Martin, Committee Clerk, Roll Call Vote Committee on Mental Health, Resolution 638. Chair Cohen. Aye. Crowley. Aye. Valone. Aye. By a vote of three in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstention, item has been adopted. So to continue, I would like to call the MTA to come and sit and, and ask my uh, counsel Kelly to administer this hearing.
Kelly Taylor, Committee Counsel, will you please raise your right hand? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committees today and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Can I hear me again? Good morning, Chairpersons Chin, Rodriguez, and Cohen, and all city council members who are present. I am Thomas Charles, Vice President of the Paratransit Division within MTA New York City Transit's Department of Buses, which is responsible for accessoride service. The subject of this hearing is billed in the Council Hearing Notice as Transportation Services for Seniors and People with Disabilities in New York City. I therefore wish to first establish that while many accessoride customers are indeed senior citizens, being elderly in and of itself does not qualify an individual for this service. Paratransit service is provided for people who meet the eligibility criteria set forth in the American with Disabilities Act of 1990. All right, thank you. Those who cannot use public buses or subways for some or all of their trips because of physical or mental disabilities. Federal Regulation Title 49 Part 37 details the eligibility rules and requirements governing how the service must be provided. Age is not a factor in the ADA criteria for eligibility, nor is a medical diagnosis. Every accessoride applicant must undergo an in-person assessment conducted by a medical professional who is thoroughly familiar with their reported medical condition. In addition to a face-to-face -face interview and application review, each applicant undergoes a functional assessment that is pivotal in determining whether their medical condition prevents the use of regular fixed route transit service. Accessoride is a shared ride, door-to-door, -door, or feeder service that requires customers to make reservations one or two days in advance. New York City Transit administers Accessoride using private contractors, including taxis and car and livery services, to deliver this service. Our paratransit program is the largest in the United States. Its operating budget is larger than the full transit system budgets of several mid-sized cities, including Denver, San Jose, San Diego, St. Louis, and Milwaukee. Last year's budget for this service was approximately $465 million. In July 1993, when responsibility for the service was transferred to New York City Transit from New York City Department of Transportation, the program budget was approximately $14 million. There were only 92 vehicles in the fleet when New York City Transit assumed responsibility for the service, whereas there are now more than 2,000 vehicles in service. We currently provide service to 136,800 accessoride registrants, and on an average weekday, there are approximately uh, 25 to 26,000 trip requests. More than 14,000 calls are received by the Accessoride Reservation Center each weekday. To maintain the fiscal and operating integrity of this costly, rapidly expanding program for those who rely on it to meet their transportation needs, New York City Transit makes every effort to operate the service efficiently. Since our last testimony before the Council on Accessoride five years ago, we have implemented several successful service-enhancing initiatives that have significantly improved the cost-effectiveness and efficiency of the services we provide. Despite many claims to the contrary, there have been no across-the-board cuts in Accessoride service. Although the cost to operate Accessoride has significantly decreased due to our efforts to operate the service more efficiently, we continue to operate fully within the guidelines of the Americans with Disabilities Act for the delivery of paratransit service. At present, 33,291 customers, or 23 percent, do not qualify as fully eligible for the service, but are deemed to be conditionally eligible. Conditional eligibility is the category for persons who can use fixed route service, but who, because of specific impairment-related issues, cannot get to or from a bus stop or subway station. Conditional eligibility categories include distance, stair restriction, cold weather, hot weather. Distance is the most common eligibility condition. 
If an individual's most limiting systems prevent them from traveling significantly more than a specific distance, for example, two blocks or five blocks, to access transit, then they are determined to be conditionally eligible for trips with a specific travel distance. Feeder service is a component of accessor rights service for customers with conditional eligibility. It entails the integration of paratransit service with accessible fixed route service to accommodate customers who need transportation to the originating bus stop or subway station for their trip, or those who need transportation from the bus stop or subway station to reach their final destination. This feeder component of accessor right is facilitated by the significant capital investment that New York City Transit has made in 85 completed ADA accessible key subway stations, the 15 that are pending, and our 100% accessible bus fleet. To support the conditional eligibility component of Accessoride, a trip-by-trip -trip eligibility process is in place to determine whether door-to-door -door service or feeder service is appropriate when a trip is requested. Under trip-by-trip -trip eligibility, some customers may not receive a trip because of a nearby accessible bus line will satisfy the customer's transportation from origin to destination without exceeding their functional restrictions. Feeder service is engaged when the distance between the point of origin and the nearest bus stop for an appropriate accessible bus line exceeds the customer's restriction, but not so for the destination. In this case, the customer will be connected to the accessible bus fixed route service, which will then complete the trip to their destination. It is important to note that this is a sanctioned approach under the ADA regulations for serving certain paratransit eligible customers. When we first introduced feeder service and the trip-by-trip -trip eligibility process, our customers were extremely concerned, but that concern has quelled over time as we have made a great effort to judiciously implement these relatively new components. As evidence of our deliberate approach in 2014, we provided approximately 6.4 million trips, of which only 24,816, or 0.4%, were trip-by-trip trip eligible, and only 46,665, or 7.7%, .7 were feeder service trips. A growing component of New York City Transit's paratransit service is the use of taxis and car service to deliver accessor rights service because it provides the flexibility needed to address same-day service issues via an additional on-demand transportation resource. This effort includes an ongoing pilot on the use of a prepaid debit card system on regulated taxis. We are continuing to learn from our customers' experiences with car service and taxis, and to work with New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission and our ser car service contractors to address areas of concern. Our continuing efforts to improve the quality of accessor right include more efficient real-time control of paratransit service using the Automatic Vehicle Location Monitoring System, a Global Positioning Satellite System, and a Wireless Data Communication Network. Mobile data terminals are installed in all of the accessorite vehicles, giving drivers maps of their routes and real-time information. This gives us the ability to reroute vehicles in response to issues that arise on the day of travel. We have also added an IVR, Interactive Voice Response System, as an element of our customer service. This provides a feature that has long been desired by Accessorite customers, the ability to be notified in advance of the vehicle's impending arrival. In addition, customers now have direct access to conduct transactions through their phone or through their personal computer. Among the functions offered are advanced reservations, trip confirmations, trip cancellations, and trip status. Our recent customer satisfaction survey reports highly favorable ratings for our drivers, the conditions of our vehicles, and our call center operations. The areas that continue to require our attention are on-time performance with respect to both dedicated and taxi and car service. To address these concerns, we are working with our dedicated contractors to provide additional training for their dispatch workforce and we are working with our car service providers to maximize the use of GPS technology. Thank you for providing a forum to discuss New York City Transit's accessorized service.
And I'm now happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Wayne. I have a few questions. I know that my colleagues have other questions too. And before I get into the question, I'd like to thank the MTA for working with us uh, the, in the Inwood area to put an elevator in the one train, Dagmistat, expanding the M100 that also became very important for the senior who live in the diamond houses in the area now to have the opportunity to get a bus going from Broadway to 10th Avenue. It was very important and also having the support to get the express bus also stopping at Diamond and Sherman. Of course, we wouldn't stop there. We want the 98. <laughs> we want the M98 also not to stop at 178, but be able to go up to Diamond. But this is a conversation that Bridget uh, we will have, and you've been very helpful to us. Uh, look, we understand that the MTA has been working with us, making major improvement. We know that when it comes to serve our, our disability community and, and our senior population, you know, what we're doing is paying back, you're reinvesting, you know, in that generation that have worked so hard. And I can tell you that someone also whose mother also rely on a sexual drive when she had to go to a doctor appointment. For the last couple of years, that's the services that she used. So we personally know we have lived that experience. And that's why, for me, it is so important that we look on how to improve, where to identify the red tape, and see where can we still do better to provide the services to that particular great part of our New York City population. One of my questions is, do you keep data on how many of those drivers who are scheduled to do the pick-out provide the services on time, or they go late to pick out this? Yes, we do. We, all of our contractors uh, know what the standards of performance are. We meet with them regularly to go over their performance. And we do have uh, detailed information about the schedules we provided and their adherence to those schedules and how they make day of service decisions to adhere to the schedules. Uh, generally, the challenges on day of service, traffic, congestion, detours, uh, we're trying to elevate the skills of dispatch, which is a skill that needs to be acquired. You, you don't generally get someone who uh, is born with those type of skills to make good decisions when they have to make a change in the schedule, make a change with a trip on a route. But we do have uh, tracking and information and monitoring so that we can improve, make uh, decisions about where we can devote time to improve the service. When we compare 2014 with 2013, can we say that we have experienced or increase or decrease or drivers being there on time? We had a slight decrease in our on-time performance, uh, a percentage point from uh, 91, say, to 90 percent. Um, we've had uh, uh, some additional training of dispatch to see how we can improve upon the, the performance. Um, part of the breakdown of the decline over that year uh, was some storms, uh, also some uh, changeover in the introduction of more car service. So we're, we're looking at it. I think a 1% decline, uh, given the changes we implemented, uh, showed that we tried to uh, hold the quality of the service. But we're not satisfied. We always want to improve, and that's an ongoing effort on our part. Okay. And what, what percentage, if, you, if we look at the breakdown, let's say of 2014, if you have it, what percentage of those trips can we say they were on time and what percent they were late and by how many minutes? About 90% were on time. 90%? 90%. And what's late, um, generally, we look at it in increments of how late because our scheduling makes certain assumptions. And what we see is... Uh, a majority of those that are late are late by 15 to 20 minutes from the scheduled time we anticipated. So we're looking to see how we might be able to address that window 
and bring in the uh, up time, on time to a higher level. How, what are the penalty for those brokers or drivers who, after you do the, re the investigation, you find out that they should know that they didn't have any excuse on why not to be there on time? What are the penalty that? It runs the gamut from uh, one of the things is we don't assign as many trips until they do improve their performance. We may take away uh, uh, service from them, a portion. Have, uh, have you done it? Like when we look at 2014, were you, with that, were you in that position? That you We've had some fluctuation and reassignments between carriers, but we also have uh, uh, a, uh, an on-time performance standard that they need to meet. Uh, in the contract, and if they're not meeting that, uh, we're also assessing uh, credits for deficiencies. But we also uh, devote a lot of attention to making sure that when they recruit and hire drivers, that they're given the proper training, and we facilitate that by giving them what we call training routes to learn. Instead of starting on the first day getting a full manifest of trips, we give them a, a partial so that over time, maybe two or three weeks, they can build to a full manifest and deliver a full uh, days of work. Okay. And of course, my question, those questions, or the last two questions are for me more because I know that we can work together to take the necessary step to improve it, but it's also to send the message loud and clear to anyone doing business with the MTA that they should know that there's some a sample that outside there for those that does not, first of all, that those who do good business, they will always have the opportunity to continue doing business with the MTA so that they can continue providing those services, but for that industry to also know that we already have cases, and if anyone is not complying or providing the service on time, that they should know that they can be also subject to the same consequences. So in 2014, like how many of those contractors were not renewed because they did not provide the services that you expect as the MTA for them to provide to the disability? I think uh, on, maybe on some of the car services, uh, we, uh, I'd have to go back and check on the timing of 2014, but we did have issues with some of the car services where we just uh, stopped the contract and reassigned their trips to others. And for our carriers, as I said, we reassign trips to others and decrease. So I'd have to go to my records and look okay. at the time. I think that those cases were like one digit? Were they like dozens of bases of those? Or what is? Yeah, generally like we have uh, 14 contractors that we call dedicated. 14. 14. And we have car service, two brokers, and four livery firms. Um, the Generally, what we find is it's not a across-the-board degradation. Maybe it's one contractor who's running into problems in coordinating service, and they get the focus of our attention. And generally, we help to resolve it by, as I say, taking away trips until they can start to manage what they're given in the schedules and get the performance standard they need to achieve. If they're not able to, then we just, uh, especially on the car services, we generally uh, recommend that they not continue in accessorized service. Great. My last question before my colleague will continue asking other questions. What is the role of the broker car service in terms of scheduling trips? Um, we schedule the trips. Same for our contractors, what we call our dedicated, those that operate the blue and white vehicles. But we do the same for the broker. Um, the broker uh, can take a large volume of trips because our, previous to the broker, what we had were individual contracts with car services. We find the broker to be able to address a larger quantity. For example, collectively, when we had individual contracts, we were able to assign 2,000 trips. Now with the broker, we're able to double that. So we give them the schedule. They are tend to adhere to that schedule and meet those time points. We are experiencing a degradation in their ability to do that. I believe the industry is in a bit of a turmoil. 
uh, and we are now working with our brokers specifically to improve their delivery of service and the quality of service. Given what the, the industry is experiencing, we're still adhering to what we need. And we have taken trips away from them, just as I described when there's an issue with performance, and have asked them to accelerate their training, uh, get the messaging to their drivers about this is an ADA trip, very uh, specific. So we are, uh, the broker's role is to take our schedules, assign those trips to their affiliates, which are a number of bases and car services, but we hold them to the same standards of performance. Okay. Thank you. My co-chair, Councilmember Chair. Thank you. Um, we've also been joined by Councilmember Deutsch uh, on our committee on aging. I know that my colleagues have a lot of questions, so I'm just going to ask a couple and then pass it on. Um, recently, there was a lawsuit by the New York uh, Lawyer for Public Interest uh, alleged that Accessori has presented uh, discriminatory barriers to service for limited English proficiency individuals seeking to apply for and using the service uh, by failing to provide proper language translation. So what current language access uh, policy that the MTAs maintain for Accessori and what language translation services are available to uh, LEP individuals with disability? Okay, I'll describe what was done prior to the uh, filing of the lawsuit. Uh, we, during litigation, we can't speak specifically about the litigation, but prior to them filing the lawsuit, uh, in September of 2014, we introduced uh, a system called Language Lines, which is a telephonic uh, service that offers interpretation of over 150 languages. That was introduced into our call center. Historically, our call center always had the uh, staffing for Spanish speaking. We had associates that could uh, address clients that uh, spoke Spanish to conduct their business in reserving trips or same-day service. In September, this was now supplemented with the use of language lines. And this was actually evolving from our Title VI requirement in our Title VI program. So uh, what was also set in motion was our assessment centers for our eligibility. Their contracts came to term, and the new contract we implemented in the uh, scope of work, the requirement to have language lines and to also staff assessors, at least one assessor with the ability to speak uh, fluently and underst be understood in Spanish. Uh, we've also staffed our own offices in our eligibility unit and their call center with uh, associates that can speak in Spanish. So as of September, our call centers are now have access to language lines, have staff that speak in Spanish, and for the first two months of this year, we've roughly had about 4,000 calls in other languages via language lines. Okay. Um, in your testimony, you didn't talk about the, the individual cost. I mean, you talk about the total budget. Can you give us an idea in terms of what is the cost for an uh, individual ride, a trip on accessory ride, uh, for the car service, for taxi? What, what is the average cost? Sure. For the uh, car service, we're averaging a, a little under $30 a trip. For taxis, which are primarily Manhattan trips, we're a little under $15 per trip. And for our primary dedicated, we're uh, about $50 a trip. I will add that that is a managed process. Uh, we're very much aware of distance and the cost of trips. And there are some car service trips that, quite frankly, exceed the cost of our $50. So we're making sure we're selecting the trips on our car service that reach that $30 average, that the taxi trips reach that $15 average, and that are uh, dedicated or averaging at $50. 
Now, I know that um, seniors has told me that they, they often carry about $40 hidden in their pocket just in case that the SSRI is late and then they are allowed to then call car service, but they usually get reimbursed back um, three months later. Is, is that the case? Yes, that's for a taxi authorization. Those that are uh, ambulatory, uh, when they are uh, miss the connection for whatever reason and they need uh, immediate transportation, we ask would they take a taxi authorization? And what they would do is pay the taxi fare and a nominal tip up front, get a receipt from the taxi cab, send that receipt in to us, and then we will process a uh, reimbursement check. Now, that's only for taxi, not also car service, too? They can use car service. Uh, we prefer that uh, they use taxi. Uh, it's uh, more, uh, the taxi receipt is a much more uh, formal document. Uh, I believe the committee is aware of the uh, IG reports, which talked about uh, potential for fraud and some actually fraudulent activity. And car services generally don't have a formal receipt. They were giving out their business cards and so forth. So we're trying to break away from that. Okay. Um, you mentioned the IG office. Um, in April of 2014, uh, the MTA Inspector General's uh, office found that from August 2012 to June 2013, 36% of accessory drivers were observed driving dangerously. 28% were either texting or talking on a cell phone while driving, and 6% were speeding. Um, despite this, the, the report stated that the safety violation and excessive cell phone use were not being reported by the MTA uh, to the broker, which means that these drivers we're not being disciplined. How is the MTA um, currently dealing with these dangerous driver uh, behavior? What type of punishment are, are, are these drivers given? How well, do we make sure that, that the rides are safe for the customer? Well, this is not, this is not accessory drivers. These are car service drivers. Uh -huh. uh, but it is under our contract. What we're continuing to do covert undercover rides, which were part of what the IG uh, uh, identified and actually uh, supported our effort in that vein. But uh, we were uh, not as formal in reporting to our uh, broker the results of our rides. We actually had face-to-face -face meetings with them. The IG asked it to be a little more formal. So now what we do is on a weekly basis, we give them the information about our observations. Uh, we look for the broker to make sure their affiliates, their drivers, uh, respond to those findings, make improvements, and if not, we go a, a final step to say we don't want that driver and sometimes that affiliate base to be participating in the program. Uh, so there's a constant weekly exchange of information, we ask for a turnaround of a response, and if we're not satisfied with the response or the actions taken, then we just say we need to uh, eliminate them from the service. So how many, um, how many drivers or company have you uh, eliminated the contracts from? On average, our broke, one of our brokers has about 60 affiliates, and from what I can see, the turnover may be uh, four or five each month where we're saying we don't wish to uh, have them on our uh, roster or providing accessory rights service. In terms of individual drivers, uh, it may be uh, three or four uh, every two weeks uh, that we're saying we're not satisfied with the actions taken by the affiliate or the broker. So it's an ongoing uh, process for us. Okay, thank you. Um, Chair. Rodriguez, uh, I'm going to come back, but I think my colleagues have a lot of other questions. Uh, thank you. Um, before I start with my questions, I would just ask the clerk to continue calling the roll on Reso 638. Continuation vote, Resolution 638, Councilmember Wills. A vote aye. Vote stands at four in the affirmative. And we'll keep the roll open until the end of the hearing. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Um, 
I have some questions regarding uh, the application process. Uh, I was curious as to the number, the percentage of people who apply versus ultimately get approved for accessory services. We average about 2,500 applications a month, and the denial rate is just around 13 percent, uh, which is typical in the uh, industry, if you will, of the uh, paratransit uh, experience. Um, the uh, uh, the appeal process, uh, the number that are uh, upheld is about 4%. Uh, so we're, we're able to um, uh, uh, move the process along with, as I said, 2,500 applications per month. I'm not sure I understood your answer regarding appeals. You, you, you don't, you lose on appeal generally? No, no, they're generally upheld. Uh, you lose on appeal 4% of the time? Yes. Uh, could you break that down a little bit in terms of the percentage of whether they're eligible for the uh, of the 87 percent of the people who are approved if they're approved for feeder service versus uh, full service? Sure. Uh, it's generally 80 percent are receiving full eligibility and 20 percent are receiving conditional eligibility. Um, the uh, uh, and that's been a change since we've introduced feeder. At, at what, prior to feeder, our conditional was almost at 40%. Uh, but now that we can enforce uh, uh, feeder service, we've seen a shift to, to more fully eligible, 80%, especially since our eligibility period is about five years and we do have a significant elderly clientele. Uh, their conditions change over those five years and they generally gravitate towards being a fully eligible uh, customer. They may start conditional, but end up being fully. I'm sorry, did you say how many they'll get conditional versus get uh, full eligibility? Yes, about 80% full, 20% uh, conditional. And full means you don't have to reapply, right? Full is? No, no, full means you're getting door-to-door -door service for all your trip requests. You're not going to get feeder service. Uh, continual full I'm sorry. is Thank something you. we introduced at when our customers expressed a concern about uh, recertifying every five years and going through an in-person assessment. We understand that some of our clients are, uh, have conditions that won't change, that won't improve. So we've introduced continual full, where at the end of their five year, we just ask them to update personal information on a one-page form, and we'll update their, uh, their profile. How long has that been the policy? Uh, I believe we started that uh, I'll say, I'll say 2009, 2010, I, I think around that period. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, in terms of uh, the renewal process, is there a percentage, do you know, have any idea on the data of people who are approved for renewal or yeah. reapplication? Yes, I would say about 75% uh, are approved for, re we call it recertification. Um, what we're seeing is because of feeder, which we also introduced in 2011, uh, those that had received door-to-door -door service uh, because we couldn't enforce feeder service now see that change, so they've de declined to recertify or they're, uh, they're not receiving eligibility at this point. All right, because in your testimony, you, you said that the service is growing. I guess the number of rides is, is down is down net though in 2014 and so far in 2015. It's remained relatively flat, and this is again what I think is the result of the feeder, where those that had received eligibility now don't refuse the feeder service, which is within their right, but we're within compliance of ADA, and so once they see that they're going to get feeder, they don't uh, recertify, or they. While they're eligible, they refuse the uh, trip itinerary. <clears throat> While I appreciate that you may be in compliance with ADA, I mean, reducing the quality of service is one way to, you know, I guess it's a way to cap costs, but it doesn't seem to me to be a way to best serve the public. Well, I, I don't think introducing feeder was reducing the quality. It's, it's accessible service. We've invested in our buses and our subways. Right now, we've not 
put trip itineraries on subways. We understand that that could be more problematic. But with 100% accessible buses, and we've really selected those customers that just have distance related, that has not reduced the quality. That's pro promoting accessibility. Well, it's like any good self-respecting elected official, I spend a lot of time in senior centers. And I will say I've gotten less complaints about feeder service but and now, as, as I hear your testimony, I understand that it sounds like ultimately, though, that you've kind of driven off a lot of people who got, were eligible for feeder service, but found that service to be untenable or not meeting their needs. And so we've kind of just driven them out of the system as opposed to actually addressing the problem. We were also experiencing double-digit growth. It was not sustainable to have this operation running that way when we had the ability to introduce what was always in the ADA from the start, feeder service. So I understand that, but this is something we needed to introduce. Well, let me ask you this. In terms of if we had a sort of clean slate, which I realize is pie in the sky, do you think that there are models in which we could, if we could reduce the cost of the service, we could obviously make it more available to these people who were eligible for feeder service, who were sort of on the, you know, in the spectrum, sort of on the fringe of whether they were you know, we're, we're eligible for just feeder as opposed to door-to-door -door service. Do you think if we, if there were things that we could do to really reduce the cost of the service, and I understand the use of the of deliveries and the taxi seems to be very cost efficient, is there other things that you think that, again, if we had a clean slate that we could do to make this program efficient enough that we could maybe get, attract those people who obviously, even by your own determination, need some help uh, and get them back into the system? Well, it's, it's uh, a quandary because the ADA was really trying to promote accessible fixed route service and only asked for complementary paratransit because you weren't 100 percent. So the goal was really to bring those into uh, the same experience anyone else has on fixed route. So while I understand that, we would still, even with efficiencies, still introduce trip by trip and feeder service as a component because it doesn't satisfy the total population. We're, we're still having a population that gets door to door, but we believe feeder and trip has a place in paratransit. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Council Member Vallone. Thank you, Madam Chair, and to my fellow chairs. Good morning, Council Member Vallone, also chair of the Senior Center's subcommittee. I would think a first point that we should address is what this hearing is about and who we're focusing on, and I appreciate the testimony, but as one of our many council members, we are the conduit of the constituents that call and express outrage, often not compliments. So starting with that premise, to, to basically listen to the testimony that's not offering change other than telling me you're not going to rehire a black car service or that numbers have gone down, I don't think I can return back to my council office and say, I have some great news for you. I don't. So I think we have to start with the first principle, which is we are providing a basic right. And we're providing a right for our seniors and persons with disabilities, two of our most vulnerable components of our society. Especially with our seniors, it's our number one growing demographic. So no matter what numbers we've seen over the last five years, those numbers are going to change. If the numbers aren't increasing, then we have to ask why they aren't increasing, and why would a demographic that has exponential growth not be utilizing a basic service? And then when we ask one of the reasons why that's happening is the complaints that are coming in. So if I were running this similar situation, I would meet with the proponents and the advocates of the groups and say, this is our service. This is the changes we've made. What are you hearing on behalf of your groups advocating for persons with disabilities and those with seniors? Have you met with any of the advocates to talk about proposed changes or any changes that you may be making on behalf of persons with disabilities and seniors? Yes, we rely on three areas. One, we have a paratransit advisory committee that we meet every other month on. That committee is comprised of uh, members that represent various organizations and also have a borough-wide uh, representation. And we discuss not only our performance. So who's on that paratransit committee? 
uh, members of, that represent various uh, organizations for those that are disabled, uh, whether it be low vision, the blind. Uh, we have a number of uh, organizations. Um, and as I say, we meet every uh, other month at our offices. We review our performance. We go through our stats. Then we also talk about any issues they're hearing from their constituents, uh, what we're doing to resolve or uh, explain or uh, interpret what our actions are. And ever, whenever we have new initiatives, we certainly discuss those as well so that uh, we can have a, a full discussion about our intention and where we think it's going. Is that we a public also, hearing? Is that a public hearing? It's a, no, it's in the uh, it's in our offices amongst the uh, uh, the community members and our staff. Has any of the other advocates been invited to that? Because the groups that we deal with on our committee hearings are telling us they have not been invited. So I'm not sure as to who's there. And uh, do we have the ability to see the results of any of those hearings on what's come up on issues and what's been changed. We can certainly uh, uh, show what we've discussed on those, but this is part of the paratransit ADA plan to have a formal uh, community involvement, and this is the mechanism we've had for uh, well over 20 years. Would you be open to increasing that group and maybe asking some of the groups that haven't been involved to be part of that? That would have to be brought to the group itself. They're not, uh, we're not, uh, we're responding to the group. It's, we don't have any say in their, uh, uh, select, in their uh, organization. We're responding to the advisory group and we're sharing our information, as I mentioned, about performance and about any new programs. I think that would be a great step. I think if I were to be a local group or a larger group to say, hey, we're going to have the ability to participate, we may not be a member of the group, but we're going to be invited. Uh, once a quarter to hear what's happening in Brooklyn, Bronx, Queens, Staten Island, Manhattan, what's hearing in Jamaica versus what's happening up in East New York and versus down in Brooklyn. I think that would be a, a wonderful first step to a dealing with some of the very local concerns that we hear as council members, which then result in these hearings that, you know, we're demanding changes to a process that is completely overwhelmed. I mean, we're hearing your testimony. Uh, I'm also looking at your very last paragraph uh, that says, the areas that continue to require our attention are our time performance with respect to both the dedicated and taxi car service. To address these concerns, we are working with our dedicated contractors to provide additional training, so far I'm hearing training, for their dispatch workforce, and we are working with our cursed car service providers to maximize the use of GPS. So what I see is training, and I see GPS. I don't see advocates, I don't see local groups, I don't see doctors, I don't see looking at criteria, I don't see why someone gets shipped from Brooklyn to Bronx to Queens to go for a 15 minute ride. I, I don't see that. So what do we tell someone who comes to us in an advocate or a group that says they're acknowledging concerns but we're looking at GPS technology and training to address that. To me those aren't substantial efforts being made by the MTA to address local concerns by persons with disabilities and seniors? Well, those efforts are in response to the community concerns. We uh, very much study our complaint trends. We take an annual survey of our customers. And I mentioned on the outreach, in addition to our Paratrans Advisory Committee, we have a ADA compliance meeting at uh, Transit that's uh, 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 meetings at Two Broadway that invites the entire uh, disabled community to these meetings to talk about uh, paratransit and other accessible uh, features of the service. And we also um, have outreach. We're invited or we uh, reach out to different communities where our customers are to explain the service and the initiatives we've implemented. And the points that are raised there about GPS and training are on point with what our community is asking for. Um, I mentioned that for training, uh, dispatch, which is a very significant activity, is an acquired skill. It's not something that a classroom is going to uh, give uh, that person the ability to 
uh, become a uh, fully expert in dispatching and making command decisions. So I realize that, and I, I would think those are would be great ways to address someone who's probably not should be driven to a very large, different route than getting to a direct route. So are we thinking that through retraining and the use of GPS on the vehicles themselves, we're going to minimize that result from happening? Yes. Have you seen, as a result of that, a, a reduction in calls of those seniors or persons with disabilities that have complained as a result of taking a circuitous route around Manhattan to get to a, a place? Yes, and that was one of the reasons why we uh, invested in a GPS system and not only had the system, but made sure that we supported the system through training. Even though our contractors have a specific scope of work for training, we supplemented ourselves to make sure that this was a focused training on the use of the equipment, not let it just become uh, a piece of equipment not used. And we fully utilize the GPS. We have what's called a dispatch alert that color codes routes that are running behind. We want a proactive measure, not a reactive measure. All right, so on that one right there, because that, that's a common call. We get that call, I mean, all the council members in the city get that all the time. I'm running late and I can't get through to the phone call and I can't make the change and I can't wait another 20 minutes for an alternate possibility. What, what would we say to those folks who are calling with that complaint? Well, the response time on our phones, I, I constantly hear about the busy signal, but we're constantly looking at our phone system. All calls are answered within 20 seconds, uh, where, uh, in fact, the survey that we received from our customer base said that there's been a, a significant improvement in our call center since we brought in a new contractor two years ago, and that their uh, calls are uh, immediately responded to. But what we're telling our customers is that on day of service when there's issues, to reach out to us because we've supplemented our street service with floaters. These are vehicles with unassigned routes dispatched to various parts of the city to respond to a stranded customer. Uh, we're trying to get that ride accomplished within 20 or 30 minutes of notice. We are also have, as I mentioned earlier, taxi authorizations for those that are able to take taxis. So we're looking at all the ways we can provide an immediate response when something is not going well. But again, it's that dispatch making that decision that being proactive when they see that for whatever reason a route is running late, that the subsequent trips on that route will be impacted. We need to see how we can avoid that by uh, reasserting. So if you see that, if you see a continuous trend, let's just pick uh, whatever, in, in Bayside or Astoria, someplace where there's a route that's being, what, what steps do you take to change that? We ask that the dispatch either rearrange and re-transfer the remaining trips to a route that's running on time or to one of our floaters, or if they're not able to do that within their own fleet, send it to our command center, which has all 15 carriers and car services at their disposal to address those trips so that we get them on time. And so there's a process. There is a, a, a process and a mechanism to uh, pay attention to trying to promote on-time performance. But I would hope reduce. then that process is part of this retraining, right? Because everything, oh, yes. everything can be made better, right? Yes, at, at, yes. It's all part of the retraining. Even in my own house, everything can be made better on getting the kids all over the place. So if you're part of that training, so, and I think those are the things we want to take from here is to hear that. And will we have follow-up on that, on the results of that retraining? Yes. How that's going to affect? I also yes. would like to see some of the inclusion of the groups that you're going to hopefully stay around and hear from, and, and you'll hear that they're not at those meetings and would love to give you that input. If, if we could just shift for a moment to the initial assessment. So when was, when was the last time the initial assessment was reviewed and, and or changed or amended? And what period of time? The assessment that we have now, when was the last time that was changed? Uh, we had a... Uh Federal Transit Administration Compliance Review uh, from 2008 to 2012. And we've had, uh, since then, the FTA has also advised us about how we're communicating the results of the determination. They wanted us to be more specific about what we observed during the assessment. So now we elaborate in the letter uh, 
how they uh, were presented at the functional assessment, what they accomplished, what they didn't accomplish. Is, so it's, it's is where the assessment is conducted. Has that changed at all? Is it all? Yes, we just awarded uh, the new contract terms. They're about three years in, in length. We're opening a new center in Brooklyn. Uh, we already have five in operation, and this will be our sixth uh, assessment center. Um, have you found the increase of percentage of those coming to the assessment centers as on an annual basis? Our, our applications have been incrementally increasing, uh, about uh, 1%. But yet we find the ridership decreasing? Yes, because what I'm seeing is new registrants are increasing, but there's a shakeout of our uh, current in incumbents, if you will, because of feeder service and because of uh, other options that they're finding in terms of transportation. If someone results in a denial of the application, how does the appeal process work? They have 60 days. They receive in their uh, notice of denial the instructions and directions and a form if they wish to request an appeal in person or in writing and uh, within 60 days. And then we schedule a hearing or a review of their written appeal. Uh, it's made by a director and a medical doctor to evaluate all of the information that was obtained in the application. Has that changed at all over time? Has the grounds for winning on an appeal or changing what you can present on an appeal changed at all? Uh, I think there's more emphasis now on medical documentation. Even though ADA says we can't require it, uh, we certainly strongly suggest to our uh, applicants to provide as much information about their medical. Is as personal they, appearance still required? It's either in per, it's your choice, in person or written, or a written appeal. Is there a difference in the percentage of denials whether someone shows up in person or in writing? No, no. And the other thing we're getting, and I think it's a pretty reasonable request, of a, a doctor determination, mm -hmm. is how often is that made? Um, on, on whether the eligibility is met or not? Well, on a, on the appeal process, there is a doctor on the board that uh, is reviewing the appeal. Well, what if someone's a patient and their doctor were to submit, I believe that uh, Mr. Ballone's eligible because his therapy and his rehabilitation is going to last for 45 to 60 days and is no way able to, to walk the four blocks to a bus stop or get to a train. How is that handled? We get that often. And, and I, in my testimony, I emphasize that this is not based on a medical diagnosis. It's supposed to be a functional assessment. How does the medical condition impede the functional ability of the customer or applicant in accessing fixed route service? Well, wouldn't, we that get be, many wouldn't that be a good way to assess that? I mean, if a doctor's giving, saying that because of his therapy or treatment is not going to be functionally able to get, I would think that'd be a very good tool to determine. Right, but the, the doctor's lines just say, we think they're a candidate for accessory. That's why we have an in-person assessment, so that we're able to see firsthand what the doctor is saying, what the customer is saying, or the applicant, and then our medical professionals make a determination based on not only the interview, the history, but also actually seeing them perform by walking. Uh, we have a mock of a front section of a bus to see if, how they board the front steps of the bus, navigate past the fare box, get to the seating, to see what is their capability of... Well, I mean, I think that it, there's going to be exceptions in emergency situations. If someone's coming out of a therapy basis, I'm not going to be able to get up and get down there to you to show I can get up and down a bus. I, I think, is there an avenue for those that are suffering something that's uh, an emergency for them as a result of an unintended procedure or emergency physical that happened to them? Yes. That those can be bypassed? Well, it's, yes, it's not so much bypassed, but we will delay the assessment. We have many cases where a sudden diagnosis and treatments need to be uh, implemented immediately. They're given temporary eligibility, and we'll catch up with them on the assessment process. The assessment is really to establish a baseline, if you will, so that we can have either continual or uh, further eligibility. But we do address emergency situations where we will put them on eligibility, we call presumptive, and let the process catch up later. Uh, we also have those that have, whether it be a broken leg, 
There is a temporary eligibility to provide transportation while they're convalescing and uh, uh, are able then to come back into uh, uh, normal service. Uh, I, there are many council members have questions, and I, I, I see them jumping in a bit. The last one that was just submitted, I think, and maybe one of the fellow council members can continue on it, because you brought it up during these questions, was the committee itself. So some of the uh, advocates here are saying that the group is not well represented, as you're claiming. They're not uh, amenable to change, that they're even dysfunctional. We can't, there was no way to elect a new president. Many people on the committee have limited contact with anyone else that's trying to reach them. They would love to have new committee members, and this would be a great opportunity to maybe address some of the concerns we're talking about. So is there anything we can address? Is there a way that maybe we can set something up or that you can? I believe our newsletter, uh, what's called On the Move, has a, uh, uh, an invitation for applications and resumes and for those interested in joining the Paratransit Advisory Committee. It's not our committee. It's a requirement under ADA for us to involve the community. Uh, the committee has its own president, its own minutes, its own meetings, and they're in an advisory under whose, capacity. Under whose guidance? Under the, the disabled community. So at this point, they can uh, submit their applications. We facilitate receiving resumes and applications, and we present it to the committee. Uh, for uh, consideration. All right, that's something we'll follow up with again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairs. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge we've been joined by Council Member Johnson, and I would ask the clerk to continue calling the roll on Reso 638. Council Member Johnson. I proudly vote aye. Thank you. Final vote now on Resolution 638 is now five in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. Uh, we were also joined by Council Member Wills, Reynoso, Goranik, Van Bramer, uh, Vaca, Weprin, and we still have Council Member Miller here, Council Member Rose, Council Member Levin, and Council Member Johnson. Uh, next, we'd like to call on Council Member Koskowitz for her question. question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm sitting here and kind of scratching my head because. I want to confer with uh, Council Member Vallone on what he said about the complaints that come into my office on a constant basis. Um, when you said that you take um, trips away from people that, aren't, that you feel aren't doing their job as well as they can, do these drivers get paid by the trip that they make? Do they get paid by the trips? No. Not the, not the dedicated providers that we have under contract. So what's the punishment? It's giving them less work, but their paychecks don't reflect that they're not doing their job well. Right, but if they don't have the trips or routes, then they won't be working for that uh, contractor or uh, getting that paycheck. So the reduction in trips means that the contractor doesn't have that work for that driver. Uh, the same for the car services. If we're saying that we're not going to give you as many trips, then they're not going to have their car service drivers receiving uh, fair revenue uh, or paychecks. What, uh, what kind of tests are the drivers given? For our dedicated uh, drivers, they must have a CDL uh, license. Uh, they're uh, given 80 hours of training, uh, which includes behind-the-wheel training, customer sensitivity. This is all prescribed in our contract under the scope of work, and we make sure that these contractors adhere to that. And then on an annual basis, they get 24-hour refresher training, and we supplement that ourselves, New York City Transit. We bring in a class called performance evaluation, especially on new drivers, to uh, remind them of all of the uh, program requirements uh, how to secure wheelchairs, customer sensitivity, uh, as well as all the safety initiatives. Well, I have to tell you that when I am um, walking in my district or riding around in my district, Accessor Ride has the worst drivers, that sometimes you close your eyes wondering 
if they're going to make, you know, if they're doing a turn or they're passing a car. It, they, they're, it's almost like they're not paying attention. That, you know, that's what I feel. And there are people that have been in, you know, mishaps on the road in an accessory. And um, I think that maybe they need more training. Well, we certainly adhere to much training. We have uh, obstacle courses at each of these locations, so they are familiar with the vehicle. But there is a, a constant review to new drivers, because not everyone is uh, equipped to work in this type of service. Even though they have a license and they can drive, they're given uh, intense training. And we do, as I mentioned earlier, establish training routes just to see how they will be uh, performing in service. And there's a thing called commentary driving, where a senior driver will accompany them to see how they're adjusting to the service. Also, now I want to get to the um, people using Accessoride. I myself have waited with a constituent after a meeting, a night meeting that ends maybe 9 o'clock. And I myself have waited for, with them for accessor ride to come. And I've waited up to two hours that eventually I will hail a cab for the person that they can get in and go home. Why does this happen? If, if you are scheduled to be picked up and the car doesn't come or comes very, very late, what do people do? What do people do if they're in a wheelchair and they go into the city and they are depending on accessory to pick them up and they don't show up? What are they to do? Well, this is, this is unacceptable. And what we've done is established a specific unit in our call center so that when a customer calls and says, my vehicle has not arrived or we're aware of it because we see a problem with that carrier. We are arranging to get a, an, a, a supplemental vehicle to address that situation. But we're also reminding our contractor that they need to be, as I say, proactive and not reactive, not wait for a situation to degrade to that point where it's now two hours or more for a customer to be uh, receiving their right. So it's a, it's a constant effort on our part to uh, look at how all of us can be reactive, but also see how we can use resources such as floaters or accessible taxis or car service to try to address those that miss the connection, whether they're a wheelchair user or they're an ambulatory customer. But it really hasn't happened yet because that's the calls I get in my office. Well, I, they had a doctor's appointment and Accessoride never showed up. I think that instance has been decreasing. It still exists, but it's decreasing, and we're learning more about how we can be better at being reactive and having those resources. But Accessoride's been around a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. So you would think that all these kinks would be addressed by now. No, I think uh, day of service brings many challenges that you, you really uh, are trying to address, but there's the unknown. Um, and on an individual route, it may, something may occur at that minute that is now preventing the driver from getting to where they need to get to. It does require good communication, which is why we put in this uh, GPS uh, AVLM system. But it also requires human interaction. We need dispatch, as I mentioned earlier, to be looking at their routes and trying to anticipate instead of waiting for a problem to happen. That's a skill that really needs to be developed. Unfortunately, it's developed through experience. Uh, but we have seen and learned a lot to try to minimize those circumstances. They still exist, but we have seen a decrease and we're continually working to see how we can uh, avoid problems like that. And I just want to ask you, when a person goes down 
to the testing to see if they're uh, eligible for accessory. Right. What do they have to do? And you said a doctor is present at the time? No, not at the assessment. That's on the appeal. Uh, but what they're, when they call uh, expressing interest, we find out uh, their availability because we will send in the mail an application and a instructions of how to arrange for a ride to the assessment and a return trip. But what is the assessment? How is a person judged if they're eligible for a sure. ride? So they arrive with their application, completed application, which asks a series of questions about their use of fixed route or uh, bus and subway. Uh, they can also share with us any of the medical conditions that they have and uh, prescriptions and treatments they're receiving. A medical professional will interview them to learn about their uh, transportation needs, how they function with their medical condition, with their uh, uh, treatment plans. And then, if need be, there'll be a uh, cognitive or a psychological assessment. And if need be, a functional assessment where I described we're looking at how they are able to ambulate, how they're able to board a uh, mock section of a bus, whether they need to use a lift instead of the steps, all to determine are they really prevented from using bus and subway accessible service. That's the mandate of ADA paratransit. It's not that it's more difficult, it's are they prevented based on their functional needs. So all of this information is, at that, is looked at at the assessment. It's then forwarded to our offices. Our own assessment personnel look to see whether all of the statements presented, all of the documents, the interview, and the medical professional are making the proper recommendation. We then communicate that to the applicant. If they disagree, they have the ability to appeal. And that's where a medical doctor and a director will listen to the appeal, any additional information that the applicant may have, and then they'll either support the uh, initial decision or make a change. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. We've also been joined by Councilmember Traeger. Uh, next, we'd like to call on Councilmember Deutsch. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, my question is, um, first of all, I want to thank my uh, colleagues, um, Councilmember Ballone and Councilmember Kaslowitz asked, uh, answered many questions that I had. Uh, but also, um, the initial application process, I believe you can do that by mail and uh, over the internet. Is that correct? No, not, not by mail. They, what we uh, suggest is they call our offices and we will mail them the application and uh, the instructions of how to arrange for a trip to go to one of the assessment centers, generally in the borough of their residence. Uh, the uh, and this was a this is a um, a change we implemented in 2007, I believe, for in-person assessment. Prior to that, there used to be a mail-in application, but the information on paper and actually seeing the person's uh, true functional capabilities led us to go to a 100% in-person assessment. Okay, so the, one of the things that. Um I've, I've been uh, seeing with my constituents is that we have something in the district, right near the district, which is like, uh, could be within like a mile away from any person that um, might need to recertify or, or bring in their original initial application. But then sometimes they send them down like, which is like four or five miles away because the, the, uh, the center nearby is either booked and then they have to be sent like five miles. And the reason why you have it, one of the reasons I believe Accessoride is there is because it's also difficult for people to travel and we're making them travel sometimes um, five miles when there is a place where they could go in which is like less than a mile away from where they reside. So is there any changes that, um, that you see that could be done that uh, I know that your office has been helpful in some of the cases that, uh, that came to my attention but on many others that they have to travel the long distance in order to recertify? Well, we try to uh, make the uh, assessment center be the one closest to their residence in the borough. 
But we do operate six assessment centers. In fact, the contracts we just awarded, we have a new one in Brooklyn that's just opening by May 8th. So in the interim, uh, all of the new applications we're receiving, we've had to have sent some to the five that are currently in operation. Once the sixth one opens up in Brooklyn, we'll be able then to uh, address more of having customers go to their local or nearby assessment center. Uh, but there are times, whether it be a high influx of applications, where we may need to uh, balance it among the assessment centers we have open. But we do accommodate if it's a hardship. I also take the opinion, though, that this is really your first time experience using Accessoride. And if you're finding that difficult, you may not find the service to your liking because this is generally what we're doing. We're satisfying your trips at all distances under a certain amount of time. So we try to accommodate, but I also see it as, as uh, a first time experience on Accessoride. Okay, so if, uh, if I have any issues, I could call your office? Sure. Okay, great. And the secondly, you also mentioned that you're trying to uh, get away from using uh, local car services and using yellow cabs. In southern Brooklyn, uh, my transportation the, is unreliable. Uh, some, I mean, we, have to, we need to improve it. As a matter of fact, I'm trying to get a, a new SBS local stop uh, for many seniors that are forced to use Accessoride because they don't have that local... Um, the local stop of the select bus service, um, uh, the, the new select bus uh, service that we have. So um, the question is, is that in my district, I don't have too many taxi cabs in southern Brooklyn, and that's the tip. So I don't have taxi cabs. So maybe we could do something or work something out with the local car services and make sure and let them know and educate them that they need to give receipts uh, opposed to giving them a business card, and this way you, you could continue relying on the local car services. Because I'm afraid that if you're getting away from uh, the local um, the local uh, car services and using taxi cabs, we're going to end up with with basically uh, um, our services will be cut in half. You know, we learn with each contract, uh, and I think for our next uh, car service broker contract, we'll be looking for, uh, and I believe the technology is available to give formal receipts to have GPS. Uh, so even though we're saying we're, we're looking at car service and maybe decreasing it, at the same time, we may be asking for things that will help uh, facilitate that service. And, and we'll certainly bring this to the attention of our brokers about South Brooklyn to see if they have affiliates that they can uh, recruit there. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part. The brokers that we have now, we'll see if they have affiliate stations in, in South Brooklyn that they can uh, bring into their network. Great, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay, okay next we want to call on Councilmember Miller. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to the co-chairs and good afternoon. Uh, to Mr. Charles, hey Tom, how are you? Good afternoon, how are you? Good, good. Full disclosure, he was once my boss, so. <laughs> we, were, we were co-workers. So, so you know. Co-workers. Right, so. Um, how much of the administration is actually implemented by the MTA of, of the overall operation? Well, we have a staff of uh, 200 uh, that are uh, New York City Transit personnel, uh, but with our contractors, they employ, uh, I would say, close to uh, um, 60,000. Uh, so uh, how, 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 do you, how do you facilitate the, the coordination between all of these contracts? There's an extensive scope of work in the contract that spells out the requirements that we need them to adhere to, whether that's transportation, uh, qualifications of their drivers, vehicle maintenance, and service delivery indicators. And we do this through technology. We have a uh, network which we tie them into on our scheduling dispatch system. Our AVLM system gives them the capability of seeing where the vehicles are located in real time. 
And on board the vehicle is that AVLM system that allows the driver to instantly communicate to their dispatch and in reciprocate, the dispatch can communicate to them. So what is your actual oversight over these contract providers? Um, do you, so obviously, uh, do you run the call centers or are they outsourced? The call center is under contract, but with all of our contractors, we take a very active project management role. We make sure that there's adherence to the scope of work. Do you have someone on site? Yes. At every call center? Well, our call center is in our main offices in Long Island City, mm -hmm. and we have a staff embedded, if you will, is that the term, in the call center, so that there's their management can talk to our management for any immediate issues or any uh, quality uh, so delivery in, concerns. So in, in 2010, uh, obviously there was a lot of service cuts and there was a, pretty much a revamp of, of, of this system here where you went to the uh, partial rides and, and so forth. Um, have we recovered from that? And is this the new system uh, working according to um, your expectations? Yeah, I think there's always room for improvement, but I believe the initiatives we've implemented, uh, really, as I mentioned earlier, to me are not cuts in service. They're adherence to ADA. But I believe that we've implemented them very well to the betterment of our customers and, and experience. So, so you, um, and, and I get the difference in, in, in being ADA compliant and actually providing the service, you know, it, that, that's kind of splitting hairs. But um, there was some pretty tremendous changes in, in, in how services are delivered at that time. Um, including, I know that there was uh, a number of companies that were forced to renegotiate contracts. Um, uh, a lot of the workforce at that time were unionized workforce, which is not the case now. Um, have we seen an impact in that in terms of retention in workers, skill sets, and experience? We here in the council last year passed a resolution sent to the state and passed here an employee protection provision so that we can maintain and retain our, our most experienced school bus operators for our most vulnerable um, citizens. I would suspect that that would be important in this industry as well. Have, do you have an employee protection provision? And um, No, because... No, we, we have a contract with the carriers where they're responsible for staffing, have their own CBAs. Um, all we ask for is that the drivers and mechanics meet certain qualifications. But I can tell you historically, um, this is almost like an entry level into transportation. So we do see a retention factor for senior drivers but new drivers are given a lot of focus because this is not a service that some of them readily can uh, take to. So there is a turnover in the, in, in the new hires, but I haven't seen any drastic change in that pattern over the past 10 years. So um, we also uh, have individual collective bargaining agreements here in the city, but there is an employee protection provision, or there was an employee protection provision that each contractor had to adhere to. Uh, to main, I think it was that important that we maintain our most experienced uh, professional drivers. Um, I, 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 and I also know that the, during 2010, when the contracts was renegotiated, it was uh, pretty extreme pay cuts were, were um, have we addressed that or? Yeah, I believe uh, for retention purposes, these contractors have changed. In fact, the employment market seems to be becoming more uh, or less uh, open to drivers. So they've increased their uh, entry level pays and their uh, general wage increases. Okay. Um. So in terms of policy, and uh, Council Member Valone talked about the Advisory Council and, and who, d does, 
do, does that advisory council actually have a voice in, in policy uh, outside of um, uh, the, the ADA law? Yes, they do. Uh, we're very sensitive to um, trying to make sure that the customer experience is uh, one that uh, they can uh, appreciate. The policy, such as recently we changed the late cancellation, we had a three-hour window. Uh, we were asked to make it a two-hour window, which we did. Um, so there is a discussion and dialogue about how we formulate policies. They have input in that. Good. Uh, and, and I'll be real brief. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. There was a, uh, I had a couple of uh, constituents who had like uh, problems, and that was uh, two of them uh, were receiving dialysis, and sometimes they would get dropped off at different time, different locations on the same block. And they, if they weren't at the specific location, maybe at the other end of the block or the middle of the block, they uh, did not receive their trip. And then they were charged with a blown trip, and ultimately their service was suspended, which required an appeal process and so forth. How do you over, uh, oversee things like um, just common sense problems like that, which really force people to lose their service for 30, 60 days at a time? We do that uh, two ways. One, we don't suspend until we have the appeal and the hearing from them to let us know what was in their control and what wasn't. We also, uh, in advance of getting to that situation, send out a call mid-month and about three weeks in that according to your patterns of no-shows and late cancellations, you are on track for a possible uh, suspension. Uh, so we're hoping that they can respond to that and let us know ahead of time, whether it's in their control, outside their control, but we also give them the opportunity to add an appeal before we implement any type of suspension. Um, in terms of the partial rides, uh, uh, do you, you, know, you coordinate with the subways and you know that all the, uh, in, in Jamaica, Parsons and Arch, Sufton Boulevard, that they are ADA compliant, the elevators are working, and, and that they can, because often the one at Parsons and Arch is never working. Right. No, we've made a, a very conscious decision at this point not to bring feeder service through the, with subway. It's all on 100% accessible buses. Okay, good. Uh, and I did have another, which I thought was very <laughs> important question, but I, 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 I uh, have all my notes on that. Thank you so much, and if there's anything else, I'm sure that, that cheers, we, we'll, we'll send you uh, some more questions and hopefully you'll get answered. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my co-chair, they will continue running the hearing. I will have to step out, but before I leave, I would like to say that First of all, continue gathering information is very important for us uh, and using those information. Like one of the things that we have noticed, and correct me if I'm wrong, but is on the prices, you say that it only costs in Manhattan $15 when the, the taxes for the consumer to use the taxes is $15. Uh, and if it's accessible, it's $50. So how much does the broker charge? Their, their average price we're paying is $30. And this is all distance related. So Manhattan, yellow taxis are all low mileage trips. That's producing the 15. The car services, we make sure that their trip portfolio supports 30. As I mentioned, the $50, we have about 40% of our trips are what's considered interbro long distance. And it would be more expensive on car service to have some of those long distance trips. So we use our dedicated providers. So it's a management to try to, as you say, get information, try to make sure we target and make sure that we're managing our costs. And that's how we achieve those rates. And, and I know by our own experience in our family that before the services were directly with the taxi, with the base, uh, the passenger had the flexibility to uh, schedule the services directly between the passenger and the base. Now the broker came in the middle. Uh, 
what are the benefits, the pro and con, of moving from having the services directly uh, uh, between the serve the the, past, the 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 person and and the basis, and now to come with a broker. Well, uh, we had some exposure to fraudulent abuse activity when they were making arrangements directly with the car service. We also, we studied uh, 12,000 registrants who were given the ability to make those arrangements with car service. Their trip demand went up 400 percent. So that said to us, we need to get a better control of that because this can now become a cost generator. And it was really discretionary trips. <laughs> so the broker not only helped us with volume because they could take many more trips on car service, but it could also limit our exposure to that fraudulent or that uh, high excessive use of discretionary trips. We're still studying the broker model. We don't like what we're seeing at this point. We're also looking at technology, and we may revert back to individual car services by setting up limits. But uh, the industry is going through uh, a lot of changes with the introduction of technology, such as apps and so forth, and we're studying that to see how we can best utilize that for the betterment of our customer experience. Thank you. Uh, next, we'd like to call on Council Member Rose. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I guess I have sort of a, a potpourri of questions. They're sort of all over the place. Um, but uh, in terms of the uh, eligibility criteria, is the criteria universal or is it subjective? It's uh, mandated and, and spelled out under the ADA. But it is a subjective process because it's case by case. What we're often told is we may have uh, persons with the same diagnosis, but it affects their functional abilities differently among the two. And that's what the basis of the assessment is about. How and, and what is preventing them from taking a bus or subway? What is their functional capability? So it is. Uh, that's why we have an in-person to minimize that subjectivity to see firsthand what is taking place. Um, and what weight or percentage um, of the assessment is attributed to a doctor's recommendation? Um, there's, uh, I guess, a weight because we want to see what, med what is the diagnosis, the prognosis, and our medical professionals who also have experience We'll see whether that's supported in the doctor's statements, whether that treatment plan is uh, showing that this person is eligible for temporary or for more permanent eligibility. So it's given weight. Uh, the ADA doesn't require that we, or we, that we have to require medical, but in our language, we strongly suggest that any information they can provide to help us make the right decision. And so um, along that line, if um, you don't require it um, but strongly suggest it, um, what's the consequence to someone who um, feels that their HIPAA rights are being violated and does not provide that, um, that type of documentation? That's a common experience at the appeal process. Uh, when they come to the appeal, they can sit there in a, in a hearing room with the medical doctor and the director, and it's all kept confidential. So they would be disqualified um, at, at the first round if, um, if, if they the, don't provide that, because if, you're saying that they get the opportunity to discuss well, that at a point. Our medical professional performing the assessment may gather from the interview that what the person's describing uh, and what they're seeing could give them eligibility. But if it turns out where there's no supporting documentation and what they're seeing in the functional assessment doesn't uh, make that connection, then it may be coming to the appeal process for the person to now bring out so pertinent So more than documents. likely there'll be a denial and- Up front. Have, right. Okay. Yes. Is, there, um, is there a cap 
that um, these ex assessment centers have in terms of uh, qualifying people? Is there a, a cap to the number? Um, no. 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 Um, I, I have a 72-year-old um, a um, constituent who um, had been assessed in a, a different borough and um, was deemed qualified for the services, yet in um, Staten Island, uh, when she was assessed after moving, um, it was determined that she was not eligible. What would precipitate this sort of ineligibility status? It would determine, uh, it would determine at the time what their condition and how they presented themselves at the assessment center and what information was presented. So, um, because the criteria is, or, or the 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 um, meeting is subjective, um, someone who is uh, deemed eligible one place could very well be deemed ineligible in another place, um, given the same set of uh, conditions and uh, uh, degree of disability. I would find that not likely, but it would determine on the individual case. But I can tell you that our assessment centers are aware of the history. So if they are eligible at another borough or they were deemed eligible, the assessment center is aware of that. But they're looking at that point in time, what is being presented, what the applicant is saying, what is their condition, because conditions change. They can either get worse or sometimes get better or that something, some point of information is leading them to say that it's a denial. Well, and they have um, the appeal process to challenge that if they wish. Well, I, I would really like to um, have a conversation offline with sure. someone because um, the situation didn't change and the conditions that were presented were consistent. Yeah, let's, let's have a, a look at that one. Um, and, uh, I have um, I, I have a uh, advisory group, a senior and disabilities advisory group, and one of my ambassadors um, suggested that um, I, I met with Uber yesterday, and they have several levels of of service that they provide, and one of it is Uber Pool. Um, maybe we should have a Cessa Pool, um, <laughs> Cessa Ride Pool. Mm -hmm. um, because I have a large number of people who access that service that go to the same medical center, the same shopping center, and um, oftentimes uh, you'll see the, the vans coming in, you know, constantly at, at like five, ten minute intervals. Um, and when it's pickup time, it gets really kind of confusing whose ride it is, who, whatever. Um, have you considered uh, something like a, a, a pool where you know it's a location where um, you have a number of rides there consistently each day um, where you might be able to schedule, where, you know, it would be sort of like a a pool. Yes, we constantly look at that. We look at addresses that have a number of trips, and we do try to uh, introduce a way of pooling or having a dedicated shuttle. But surprisingly, most of the customers want their own schedule. They don't want to be in a grouping, because sometimes to coordinate that, we need some flexibility on their part for times and pickups so that we could have a group picked up. What we find is each wants to have their own timeline, and that's what you're seeing, all those vehicles coming in at different times to the same location. Um, it's something we look at constantly, but it, as I say, it's, it's not always uh, our customers' uh, uh, desire to do that. Um, and I have an oversight question. Um, you utilize uh, contracted services uh, of car services. Um, uh, and 
one of the um, consistent complaints we hear are that the drivers are, are rude, um, uh, even threatening um, not to pick up. Um, uh, is there some type of oversight of these services and um, do you have any sort of uh, uh, recompense uh, in terms of what happens? Yes, we uh, track the complaints. We also do our own covert rides. And when we find that kind of behavior, we uh, present it to the contractor car service. We ask for an action plan. And if we're not satisfied, we uh, say that person can no longer uh, participate in accessory rights service. And this is a, um, a formal reporting. We, uh, we uh, make sure that when we're reviewing our performance with our carriers, there's a, there's a section of time spent on drivers that seem to uh, receive a, complaints. So we're making sure that there's progressive discipline, since they're represented, mm -hmm. that there is some action, progressive discipline, for a change in the behavior we're looking for. And um, my last question. Um, we actually have a contractor um, or where I guess it's like a depot where they park the buses, the drivers come and get the vans in, in the morning um, and, and return them. Um, and this has been very disruptive in, in the community. Um, a lot of noise very early in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, double parking, buses uh, or vans left idling just bad neighbor um, behaviors. Um, what, what sort of oversight is this? And you know, my office has um, contacted this uh, contractor um, almost on a daily basis due to these complaints. Um, what can be done to, you know, get them to work with the community so that these complaints uh, cease? Well, it was brought to our attention as well. This is on the, the North Shore? Yes. 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 And we've asked that contractor to uh, make sure that the drivers first are aware of their impact. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I believe that contractor has rerouted where the vehicles can come down to the yard instead of using all of the side streets and so forth. Mm -hmm. To, be able to open up parking spaces on their property instead of having them park on the street. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're looking at more of those efforts, and I believe uh, since we were brought, that was brought to our attention, those actions have started to take place and that there's less of a, uh, a problem. But whenever there's a problem, we wish to be alerted, and we'll work with our contractors to find how to be a good neighbor in that uh, area. Okay, I'm going to um, keep in touch with Good. you because mm -hmm. this uh, has turned into quite uh, an issue. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Chair. Thank you. Um, Chair Cohen, question? Thank you, Chair Chen. Uh, I was just curious, uh, do you know what the percentage of the customers uh, uh, use a wheelchair are? Yes. We have about approximately a little under 15% are wheelchair users. But I can tell you that they use the service much more than our ambulatory. They take about 26, 27 percent of the trips. And how do you pair them up with the level, like, obviously there are issues with yellow taxi cab accessibility and uh, livery car accessibility. How do you match them up to the, the right kind of vehicle? Um, this is where our uh, technology and our system our scheduling system takes place. We've enhanced it to integrate uh, what you call a, a client profile, their equipment needs, uh, and any other needs they miss, might have, special instructions, and so that we dispatch the correct vehicle. And so uh, we'll have a mix of clients that have scooters, wheelchairs, oversized wheelchairs, uh, or that need what we call lift required, they may not have, they may not be a wheelchair user, but they can no longer take steps, so they need a ramp or a lift. So we're constantly asking our customers to keep us updated on their changes. 
their equipment needs, because their eligibility is five years, things change in those five years, and we ask them to update. But we do that because our system will enter that data and make sure we're dispatching the correct vehicle. Do wheelchair users use yellow cabs and livery cabs as part of the access ride service? We have been working with uh, TLC and our prepaid debit card to promote accessible taxis. So we do have some wheelchair users in Manhattan who make use of accessible yellow taxis. And we're trying to look how we can move on to the outer borough green taxis as well. Now, I'm just curious, not that I, you know, obviously everyone's entitled to the, uh, to the same level of service. Is there, it, it, it's more expensive to move people? Uh, and when you gave your, your breakdown of uh, cost in terms of uh, uh, per ride, uh, does it break down? Is there a different differential and depending on the need of the user? No. No, that's the standard for uh, a trip. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, next, we'd like to call on Council Member Traeger. Thank you. Thank you to all the chairs here today for this very important hearing, and I thank you, uh, Vice President uh, Thomas Charles. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I just, I, the, the hearing topic today is uh, transportation services for seniors and people with disabilities in New York City. And I know we're focusing, I appreciate we're focusing um, mainly today on accessorite. But I just want to kind of just highlight where one end of, one end of the MTA's uh, choices or, or, or decision-making process impacts this end. When you reduce, take away, cut transportation services, buses, trains to sections of our city, you increase reliance on accessorat. You increase reliance on these uh, Added on these services, and and there are certain people who just simply cannot. Because let's look at some of the reasons why. But I just want to highlight that in Southern Brooklyn, where I represent and where I grew up and live, um, the MTA in recent years uh, cut back on the B82 bus, which services a huge senior population. Uh, cut uh, it, it removed the X28 on, on the weekends. It completely removed the X-29. Uh, the B-64 we had to fight to get back to come to Coney Island. Um, and we are shortchanged in many ways. And that, that, of course, will lead to people with no other alternatives or options to turn to uh, accessoride or other types of services. Um, I also want to just highlight an issue that has not been discussed yet today, but I think it's it's very important because the hearing topic is very crucial during this time. And I'm not sure if you have this information today, but if not, I would like to follow up with your office about it and the MTA about the emergency planning and resiliency and how much damage the MTA sustained as a result of the latest storm, how much money has the MTA received uh, in federal state funding prior, after Sandy, uh, because when you look at some of the locations that were inundated and, and devastated by the storm, they are huge senior citizen populations. And I represent a, a, a district where I have many NORCs, I have uh, senior citizen centers, organizations, senior high rises, and they're in a, you call it flood zone A, I'll call it triple A. They're, they're in prime time evacuation zone. But the F line on Neptune Avenue, right next to the senior buildings, does not have an elevator to help them evacuate in the event of a mandatory evacuation. And that has been one of the biggest issues in my district. In the event of an emergency or a mandatory evacuation, what does the MTA have planned to help move thousands of senior citizens out of harm's way. And I just, I'd be curious to hear your feedback and comments on this very important topic. Well, I can only comment on the paratransits uh, right. plans. Uh, we work with the New York City Emergency Management, formerly known as the OEM, on uh, evacuation planning. 
In fact, we were uh, very uh, vital in, during Sandy, Irene, in providing our vehicles to um, address homebound evacuation, but also health care facilities, nursing homes in the Rockaways and in Brooklyn. And you, you found gas during that time? We did. We, we uh, actually participated in the Office of Emergency Management's uh, uh, ability to get uh, fueling done at select stations in the city, as well as uh, I think Floyd Bennett Field had a, uh, a military fueling operation that we were able to participate in. And we also have some of our own providers, contractors, have gas lean tanks and we're able to keep up with the uh, a provision of gasoline and diesel. So we had resources, and our plans are to uh, make ourselves available. Our first primary objective, unlike fixed route service, usually during a impending storm, we've already brought customers to their destinations. And if an evacuation starts to mobilize, our primary mission is, one, to make sure that our customers who are already brought to their destination can either keep to their schedule to be brought back home or should they wish to go home sooner, that we're available to do that, while simultaneously freeing up our vehicles to help with health care evacuations or homebound evacuations. And, and I, I, I appreciate, I certainly I thank all your, you and your, all your members and your, the workers who helped. I certainly appreciate that. But I just want to highlight something that in my district and across other districts that were impacted by the storm, there were many, numerous seniors and people with disabilities stranded in high-rise buildings. So the mayor could issue any evacuation order he wants or she wants, but the reality is they're vulnerable not just with age or with their physical condition, they're also vulnerable with their financial situation. People just can't pick up and go whenever we say they have to go. So I really believe that the MTA and various divisions of it has to coordinate with our emergency planning and our resiliency planning and making sure they were able to mobilize and move thousands of people out of harm's way, and that was not the case uh, during and after Sandy. And so, again, I repeat that we have train lines right next, literally right next to senior high-rise buildings that don't have elevators. And so we need to fully examine how we are coordinating and how we're using these federal Sandy dollars to increase our resiliency, to make transportation services for seniors and people with disabilities more accessible and better uh, in the city of New York. And I thank you, Chair, for your time. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Traeger. I think we could follow up with another hearing uh, with your committee on uh, recovery, resiliency, and transportation, maybe with also the aging committee on this issue. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, one last question before we let you go, Mr. Charles, and thank you okay. so much uh, for answering our question um, this morning. Um, it seemed like the Taxis, you know, accessible taxi service um, is a really uh, important service, and then also it can help, you know, cut down on the course. So are, is MTA working together with um, the TLC on, on the accessible cabs? Because um, there are, there's been some issues with seniors um, complaining about having trouble getting into uh, the, the Nissan. NV200, the taxi of tomorrow, and also people who use wheelchairs um, has also complained about the, the way the, the taxi is designed. Are you working with TLC to see how to really make the taxi um, of tomorrow really truly accessible, that this will be uh, an important form of transportation uh, for the disabled community and for senior who needs accessorized um, can really use these uh, accessible taxi. We are working in a collaborative effort with TLC on how to uh, incorporate accessible taxi service. We are not uh, at a level where we're discussing a typical vehicle. All we're talking about is the existing medallions that have, that are accessible, 
uh, taxis and how we might be able to uh, use that in our accessorite trips. I'm sure in our discussions we will get to, because the accessible fleet they have is varied. It's not all Nissan 200. They have Dodge Caravans, Toyota Siennas. So at some point I'm sure we'll get to that uh, discussion. But right now we're uh, trying to uh, take what's existing and see how we can uh, promote that through our accessory ride clients. Well, I, I really encourage you to uh, actively participate based on the experience and, and the information that you have collected you know, from user of the paratransit system. And it would be very valuable to make sure that down the road, we want to see all taxi cabs as, you know, truly accessible. Uh, one of my constituent chair of a community board, when she was in London uh, recently, and she happened, you know, broke her foot and she needed um, this kind of vehicle. She said, Margaret, why couldn't the, all the taxi in, in New York City be accessible? Uh, so that's something that we really need to, to uh, focus on. And uh, I think we might have other questions that we have missed that we didn't get a chance to ask you, uh, but we have a lot of advocates and, and uh, the customers of uh, Accessorize who are here to testify. So we will let you go, but we will follow up uh, with some other questions uh, to your office. And thank you very much for being here this morning. Thank you. Uh, next, we want to call up um, Deputy Department for the Aging, Carolyn Resnick, Deputy Commissioner, uh, and also Karen Taylor. Uh, Assistant Commissioner for Community Services. I guess the, the council have to administer the oath first. I need water. Eric Bernstein, committee council. Can you raise your right hand, please? <laughs> Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Good morning, Chairperson Chin and members of the Aging, Transportation, and Mental Health and Developmental Disability, Alcohols and Substance Abuse and Disability Services Committees. I'm Karen Resnick, Deputy Commissioner for External Affairs at the New York City Department for the Aging, and I'm joined today by Karen Taylor, our Assistant Commissioner for the Bureau of Community Services at the Department for the Aging. On behalf of our commissioner, Donna Corrado, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to discuss transportation services for seniors and people with disabilities in New York City. In New York City, the largest programs that are geared toward meeting the transportation needs of older adults and people with disabilities are not under the jurisdiction of DIFTA. As a point of clarification, the MTA, who you just heard from at length, and not the department, administers Accessoride, the city's paratransit service. Accessoride provides transportation for people with disabilities who are un unable to use mass transit for some or for the entirety of their trip. And another MTA program, the reduced fare metro card discount for individuals who are 65 of age or older or who have a qualifying disability. There are also various other forms of medical transportation paid for by Medicaid and health insurance plans. DIFTA currently funds 14 transportation-only programs that vary in size and scope. And these programs serve 39 community districts throughout the city. The Department for Aging Transportation Services Program with approximately 250,000 contracted units or one-way trips per person is a complement to the transportation services available to seniors in New York City. In addition to the 14 transportation-only programs sponsored by DIFTA, about 80 of DIFTA's 250 senior centers have some form of transportation for seniors to access the center and travel from the center to participate in activities such as retail and grocery shopping, educational workshops, cultural events, and social gatherings. 
The objective of DIFTA's transportation services program is to prevent seniors who are unable to travel or access public transportation from becoming socially isolated or from declining physically by assisting them in getting to and from places they need to go in their communities, which is referred to as individual transportation. Seniors are eligible for individual transportation trips if one, the trip is beyond walking or driving ability, two, a permanent or temporary physical, mental, or sensory limitation prevents utilization of public transportation, or three, a trip by public transportation requires transfers beyond the individual's ability. At the same time, DIFTA's transportation services program also offers group transportation to enhance community engagement for seniors by offering recreational, social, and educational trips. In advance of the forthcoming transportation services program RFP, DIFTA released a concept paper last February. The concept paper highlights some of the defined and developing parameters, expectations, and standards of the transportation services program funded by DIFTA. It is our plan to test new transportation models that exploit technologies to broaden the scope and increase the efficiency of a very limited service. Responses to the concept paper were accepted from interested parties until 5 p.m. on April 16th. DIFTA plans to take into consideration the feedback, suggestion, and comments offered by the community when crafting our upcoming transportation solicitation. We expect to issue the solicitation this summer for contracts beginning on July 1, 2016. Current anticipating funding for the Transportation Services Program is $4.8 million. Relative to other transportation programs, the DIFTA Transportation Services is limited in both resources and capacity. To maximize available funding for the program, DIFTA is seeking innovation, creativity, and formal linkages to and communication with other transportation resources and service providers within the communities being served. DIFTA is looking to contract with providers who can resourcefully operate a program that augments the city's ability to achieve the following objectives. To help ensure the health and safety of the senior population being served, to enable access to medical appointments, grocery stores, banks, food pantries, and pharmacies, to facilitate access to social, cultural, and religious programs that maintain and enhance quality of life, and to establish and maintain linkages and partnerships with other appropriate services. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify about transportation services for seniors and people with disabilities, and I'm pleased to answer any questions that you may have today. Thank you. Okay, uh, Chair Cohen, go ahead. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, regarding uh, the transportation as associated with senior centers, th those are run by the center? Who, who actually, how does that work? Yes, our, pro our contract, we, we contract out all our services and some of our senior center programs have transportation affiliated with the center and then they run those themselves. They hire a driver, they procure the vehicle, it's all pursuant to a contract? Yes. Okay. Uh, and what, what percentage of centers have that? Have that in? Oh. 32%? Will the RFP affect those services? No, actually, the RFP is only addressing what we call transportation only. So they're standalone transportation programs, not affiliated with the senior center contract. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Vallon. Can't say good morning anymore. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes. We are. We're all eagerly anticipating some of the results and changes. But um, I mean, clearly today is to listen to the concerns of our seniors and persons with disability and, and everyone's looking for acknowledgement for some changes or things that are working well that we want to expand or things that need some tweaking. Is, is there anything at this point that uh, Difter or, or you are willing to say that uh, whether it's in the upcoming RFP or in the current format that what changes or additions will be made? 
Well, precisely because we are about to RFP, we really can talk about upcoming changes, but the concept paper speaks to some of that, and what we're hoping to get from the community are some newer uses of technology. I think some of the things you heard in the, in the previous testimony about potential partnerships, um, use of taxis, other forms of vehicles, vouchers, um, you know, there's a, a whole variety of ways that things can be done differently. And we'll hear that back, I think, when people respond to our RFP. So we're looking for some creative new thinking. Um, what, what's some of the largest increase in demand on DIFTA with the current transportation being provided? The, go ahead. Okay. Uh, the um, current level of transportation that's being provided through our various contracts in fiscal 14, we provided a, six, a little over 600,000 one-way trips is how we, how we count the units. Um, and that is w including senior centers, uh, transportation only contracts, um, both of those areas. But you're asking what the greatest demand is for. Oh, the greatest well, of, of that 600,000, so how has that percentage changed or increased or decreased from previous years? I think it's remained fairly... Well, the fundings remain flat, stable, so I would imagine yeah. that the rides remain pretty right. constant. The, the programs well, it's, are, are well-utilized, um, and they have been over the years, but the fun because the funding has been flat, it's been pretty stable. Well, I mean, funding aside, has the demand increased? I think certain types of demand have increased. Um, and what would those be? Well, I think the uh, one, one of the things that we mentioned in the concept paper is that we know that there's a need for more individual trips, which is a, you know, a challenge when you've got <clears throat> most of our transportation services by van or vehicle, you know, multi-person vehicle. Uh, so we are looking for ways to expand our ability to provide more individual trips. Um, and I think demand for other areas of the city <coughs> where our current providers are not located or are not able to serve at this point. We'd like to have a little wider spread. So those are things we'd be looking forward to in the next RFP? Well, that, that's exciting. I mean, those are the things we're, we're hearing also. We want, mm -hmm. our seniors want the addition to go to new places and different places and not always be handicapped by time limitations and where they have to go. I mean, Council Member Rose brought up a good point in the previous questioning of if there is a site that has continuous and numerous requests and applicants and seniors, whether it's a senior center or assisted living facility, is there a way to make that like a half hour type of pick up and, and drop off so that it's not individual and say, listen, at 10, 30, 11 to the, the high peak hours, mm -hmm. we're gonna have a transportation provided and as long as it's provided within a local area that uh, we'll have well, Some of our programs like that. function that way now. Yeah. I mean, we have, we have varieties of options that currently, for example, in Brooklyn Heights is a little shuttle mm -hmm. um, that runs and it has a route and seniors can get on and, and get off and know the time schedule. You know, others are more by appointment or group rides to and from. So, you know, each kind of develop their own personality. So there's room for growth and diversity. I, I think yes. that's what we're hearing because that, that shuttle yes, is Yes, and that's the direction idea. we're looking mm -hmm. to go in. Okay, well, I look forward to working with you on, on the RFP and upcoming changes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you. Are, how many of the, um, the vehicle that's provided for DIFTA for this transportation are um, equipped for wheelchairs? Do you know? It's a requirement that any transportation program or service have at least one vehicle that's handicapped accessible. For any new vehicle that's being purchased to replace older vehicles, uh, they all have to be handicapped accessible. So they have to, right. all of them have to. I don't, know, I don't have an exact number. We have a little over 200 uh, vehicles in throughout all of the programs that provide transportation. I'm not sure if all of them at this point are handicapped accessible, but every program has at least, at least one vehicle, if not all of their fleet being handicapped accessible. So how many programs do you have? We had, I believe, 80 senior centers and... Uh, oh, what you said. Th yeah, it's... 14. F in 14, yeah. 14 yeah. stand, what we call standalone or transportation only. 
So and there are few. You're right now you're in 39 uh, community district. So with the new RFP, you're going to be able to expand it to 59? That every um, community board area district well, we're will have the program? Yes. We're definitely hoping to see some creative approaches that will um, expand the services to every community district. And also the, that the seniors taking the, the service can go in, into other districts. Right. Yes, right? we're that, aware that's, that's a problem. That, yeah, I think that's, that's a very, um, that's a big issue. Yep. They, oh, well, we only uh, service you in community board two if you go into community board three, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so we gotta make sure that uh, we do want the seniors to socialize to go across districts, so we wanna <laughs> make sure that happens. Um, and also how will DIFTA ensure that the programs uh, address linguistic and cultural diversity in the community that you'll be serving? Well, in all of our um, RFPs, I think we we indicate that all services must be culturally and uh, you know appropriate. Mm -hmm. So with this new budget of 4.2 million, are you gonna be able to, uh, how much of an increase you will be able to provide? In rides? Yeah. I don't think we know that yet. Mm -hmm. It's, it's gonna depend on how the RFP is shaped and what the proposals look like. But it's a, it's a very modest increase and it's a very small program. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, one of the difficulties is it's sort of looked at as an alternative or complement to Accessoride, but as you know from the numbers you just heard, it doesn't compare. So we are never going to be able to be the paratransit system for older people with a $4 million budget. Yeah, but I guess I, it would be good to sort of like down the road to, to hear from you in terms of what will be uh, a good optimal budget that can uh, provide enough services where we can help seniors be able to access, you know, all these services and not being isolated. So if we want to do a really a good comprehensive job, what would it cost? So that at least we could prepare for that. If it's just, you know, it's 4.2, what should we be fighting for to really help improve the system? So that's something that we look towards uh, DIFTA to really give us some guidance on that. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> Back to you on that. Okay, because we know we have to expand the service, so, um, but we're looking forward to seeing the RFP and see how we can at least uh, take the first step. Um, so thank you for being here, and Great. next we're gonna um, call on the next panel. I know some of you have to uh, take a Cesaride back, so if you're still here, really appreciate it. Uh, Eileen Cox from JASA, Leslie uh, Reeses, uh, also from JASA, from Brooklyn, uh, Anthony Seri Ducci, Seri Ducati. And we also have Molly Krakowski and Abigail Adler, all from Brooklyn. Thank you for being here. And hopefully the Cessna ride will wait for you, right? <laughs> to go back. Thank you. If not, we're gonna call the MTA and, make, and get a special accommodation. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna have to set the clock. Um, so please summarize your point because we have a lot of people waiting to testify. So thank you. Oh, it's three minutes. Um, I wanna thank the committee for sponsoring this hearing. Make sure your mic is on, please. It's on, just have to close. Okay, thank you for uh, allowing us the chance to express our concerns about Accessoride. My name's Aileen Cox. On Sundays, I'm one of the 164 seniors that attend Sundays at JASA uh, at John Jay College in Manhattan. Many of us use Accessoride to attend this 
a continuing education program. Some of us use walkers, motorized wheelchairs, and canes. In my own case, using public transportation has become very difficult and risky because I have spinal stenosis and osteoarthritis. I'm 84 years old, and I'm very anxious to maintain the quality of my life as I grow older. So I have included uh, in the testimony a, a letter sent by members of JASA concerning uh, the, our frustrations in using accessoride. Uh, I believe it was sent to the, uh, to the MTA in January. We haven't heard uh, a response from them as yet, and since apparently there's an advisory committee, I would be very happy to receive a response. We would all be happy to be able to talk directly to them. So let me underscore some of the issues that have been mentioned here. One, waiting. We're told to prepare to wait for 30 minutes. We frequently wait for more than an hour. Sometimes accessory doesn't come at all and we're left stranded and helpless. And Accessoride does not call us and notify us if there's a delay or problem. So on one occasion, I was called at home and to be told that my trip was canceled. But I am standing outside on the street waiting for a return trip. So I have no way to receive that message. Many of us use cell phones to obtain help. But we don't feel that there is an awareness that we are older, we are disabled, and we need help. And to be stuck standing on a street corner somewhere with, with only our cell phone, we are the ones reaching out and saying, what's going on, what's happening? Two, dispatch your communication to drivers. Dispatch your communication to drivers is poor or non-existent. Drivers are not informed of major delays, special events, blocked streets, traffic tie-ups, or bridge and tunnel closing. Very often, I'm the one saying to the driver, there's a marathon today. Did you know? No, he didn't know. Poor route planning and driver training. I, I, I see that there is driver training. Uh, it doesn't appear to be sufficient. Many drivers are not familiar with the best routes and they are unfamiliar with alternative routes. Driving in New York City, as we all know, is a real challenge. Drivers need training to travel efficiently to prevent late arrivals and excessively long rides. Ride sharing and route planning. Recently, I made my weekly reservation to attend the Sundays at JASA program and was told to be ready at 8 a.m. on Middle Neck Road in Long Island, where I live. I was picked up and then driven to Co-op City in the Bronx. Then we did a second pickup at the Upper West Side of Manhattan. After two hours of riding, I arrived at John Jay College at 10 a.m. Um, is there any, I was physically drained by that time. I think that when the dispatcher determines the routes, can the condition of a disabled senior citizen be taken into consideration? Ride sharing requires wise, common sense judgment. It is a very important job and drivers really need a lot of training. And I often, sitting in the car, can't understand how the dispatcher could have planned this ride. Proper vehicle ID. Now these dispatcher cars are often black cars with no sign on them. We don't know, you know whether these are the accessorized cars. That means that we have to go there, over to the car, to try to find out, is this an accessorized car? Now that's really an uh, unsafe thing for us to have to do. And they're supposed to have signs in the car or on the car indicating that they are accessorized, and many times we don't know. Um, 
While we certainly depend on and appreciate the existence of accessoride, we need and deserve just and considerate treatment in our aging years. Therefore, of course, we look to improve communication uh, and coordination between us, the passengers, and accessoride. And I hope that we can be involved in some of these meetings that the speaker from uh, the MTA uh, told us of. Thank you very much. Thank you, council members. Thank you. Next. Good morning, or I should say good afternoon. My name is Anthony Sete Ducate, and I have been using the Accessoride program since 2009 when a surgical procedure left me with a damage from oral nerve. Let me start by stating that I believe Accessoride is a great program that has made it possible for me and others with disabilities to be able to lead full lives in this, in this city. That is, when it works properly. This is not always the case. Accessoride is neither a privilege nor a benefit. It is a necessity that the New York City transit system is obligated to provide in accordance with federal law. Many in the transit system, administrators, reservationists, drivers, and other staff, do not appear to understand this. They seem to feel that the service they provide is out of the goodness of their hearts. We are expected to have full knowledge of our destination, even though we may never have been there before, stand outside in all sorts of weather waiting up to 30 minutes for a vehicle that may or may not show up on time. Drivers that arrive early express annoyance when we are not ready before the appointed time. Some refuse to get out of the car or bus to help a passenger. You seem to forget that we are the ones needing assistance, not you. When a ride fails to show up within the allotted 30 minutes and I call in to report this, I am often left on hold for an extended period while someone tries to find out where the driver is. Remember, I'm standing in the street holding a cell phone while leaning on my cane. Often the response is, did you call the car service? No, I didn't. Isn't that your job? This can take an additional 20 minutes, assuring me that I will be late for my appointment. Should I be offered a taxi voucher in lieu of the promised ride, I am forced to lay out extra money that I didn't budget for. Reimbursement from Accessoride can take up to two months. For someone living on a monthly Social Security check, that means I have to do without food or other necessities. That brings me to the cost of an Accessoride trip. In every city, seniors and people with disabilities are accorded a reduced fare on the transit system. Why is it that Accessoride passengers are being discriminated against and forced to pay full fare? Many of us have limited income. I, for one, have to consider the cost every time I arrange for an Accessoride trip. Thank you, council members. Thank you. Next. Hello, my name is Leslie Reese and I've been using Accessoride for six years. The discomforts and disabilities of advanced age have been ameliorated to an extent by the services of Accessoride. My life has changed, but Accessoride has helped me to navigate these changes for the most part. I can now travel to doctor's appointments and take advanced education classes, knowing that Accessoride will get me there and get me home. For this, I am eternally grateful. However, there are some difficulties that I have encountered that need some attention. Almost all of these problems have been with the broker service, not the MTA. First of all, the scheduling of trips often is quite puzzling. Last week I had a doctor's appointment in Brooklyn that should have taken 15 minutes to get to by car. We went from Prospect Heights where I live to Brooklyn Heights, an opposite direction from the doctor's office, and ended up 30 minutes late from my appointment. I was in the car for 65 minutes. Another time I was picked up on the Upper West Side taken to East Harlem, and then to my home in Brooklyn, more than one and a half hours in the car. 
Who does the scheduling? It often seems quite random and careless. Several times when a pickup has been late, I call the broker and am told the wrong information, i.e., he'll be there in seven minutes. I call after 20 more minutes and am told he's five blocks away. After a 30-minute wait, I call and get a taxi authorization. Why don't they tell us the truth? Some broker drivers speak poor English, and it is hard to communicate with them. On two occasions, we were almost in the Holland Tunnel going to New Jersey when we should have been heading uptown. Twice, drivers came more than one half hour early to my home for a pickup and told me they would leave me if I didn't come out then. On two other occasions, whenever the driver stopped for red lights, he opened his door and spit at every stop. I suggest that the broker, sir, broker drivers receive some training about how to behave and also not be hired if they, if they do not speak English well enough to be understood. Please consider these criticisms. They are made in the spirit of trying to improve an accessoride for all of us elderly and disabled patrons. Thank you again for hearing our concerns. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Molly Krakowski. I'm the Director of Legislative Affairs at JASA, and I want to thank um, uh, Chair Chin, uh, Rodriguez, and Cohn for holding today's important hearing on Accessoride. In preparing for today's meeting, I searched my computer for my files on Accessoride. Uh, as many issues involving accessoride service are not new, and discovered complaints going back to 1999, and prior to that, they're probably just not in the computer. Um, I remember attending a task force meeting relating to the subject in 2003 when I began at JASA, so we're still here, still looking at accessoride, trying to improve the services available to individuals in need of transportation and assistance in New York City. Um, I, I know that uh, you've heard from all of these folks who are all brand new to testifying at City Hall, let alone attending a hearing at City Hall. I don't want to belabor what I know you're going to hear, but I do want to highlight one quick story of uh, one of our members, a longtime advocate, retired teacher, and a very active person. She recently fell while getting off of a New York City bus using the lowered platform, and she said that she lost her balance, and as a result, she ended up with a broken hip. She should have had an accessoride application filled out for her, as far as I'm concerned, at the hospital prior to discharge. And in my mind, her doctor should have been able to clearly state her need for accessoride upon returning to the community. And neither of these things happen um, because they can't. And once, once home, she requested an accessoride form. She filled it out, but informed me that she could not complete it and required, you know, because she didn't have an updated passport photo along with the application. And in order to have the application process, it needs to be a full uh, application. So she was ready to throw out the application because she didn't have a photo or an easy way to get that photo. I offered to come and take a picture of her. She said that even if she's approved, she lives so close to 34th Street that she doesn't think she'll be able to get anything but um, possibly a feeder service, but they'll probably say that she'll be able to just get on a bus, which she's fearful of doing because she just fell on a lowered ramp on one of those buses. Um, why can't we make life easier for people who are in need of this service? Uh, would it be possible to have a DMV-style photo booth or picture-taking opportunity if they, in fact, have to go to a processing center? Um, could we allow hospitals to make a determination for patients before discharge to ease their transition back into the community so that they have that service and are not re-hospitalized? Um, you have a copy of the testimony, um, a copy of the uh, survey that was done uh, attached to one of the testimonies. Um, I just wanted to uh, really urge if there is in any way uh, possible to make um, some of the pilot programs that have been uh, suggested and tried out having to do with taxi service and other door-to-door -door service available. Uh, it seems like there might be a cost-effective way to provide some of these trips, which don't cost $30, uh, to people um, in the community. And really with that aim of keeping people in the community with dignity and autonomy and allowing them to lead productive lives. So thank you. Thank you for coming today, and thank you for testifying. And we will um, take your suggestions and compile them uh, for the MTA. And thank you for waiting over three hours to testify. We appreciate it. Yeah.
Next, we'd like to call on uh, James uh, Wiseman from the United Spinal Association. Uh, Mer oh, Merla Madonna. Joe Rappaport and Amy Paul. Uh, please begin. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Joe Rappaport, and I'm from the Taxis for All campaign, and we're here as a panel, uh, more or less. Um, we represent independent not-for-profit organizations, uh, or citizen advocates with extensive professional and, profe and, and uh, personal experience representing people with disabilities or older adults who live in New York City or travel here regularly. And there's a list on the page four of uh, our testimony. We're testifying today because the city and the council have a rare chance to both reduce costs and improve transportation services for people with disabilities and seniors. Uh, our communities, uh, aging uh, senior communities and disability groups are appearing together, something that doesn't happen often because we're united in suggesting how these cost savings and improvements to excessive ride and city taxi service can be achieved. Um, as you've heard, um, excessive ride is expensive, it's inconvenient, but it doesn't have to be that way. Much of the service could be switched to, to taxis and particularly to accessible taxis. Uh, the same may be true of other uh, city-funded transportation services, such as those uh, underwritten by DIFTA. And Jim Weissman of the United Spinal Association, here, who's here to my left, is going to speak on some of these issues. Um, there's an obstacle to making a full, real switch. The taxi selected, as uh, we've talked about a little bit tonight, today, the taxi selected by the city, the Nissan NV200, the taxi of tomorrow, the so-called taxi of tomorrow, has significant design flaws that negatively impact the ability of people with disabilities and seniors to ride in them. And Amy Paul, senior advocate, will speak to us, uh, to my right, will speak to what some of those problems are, and I'll add a few notes as well. Um, in its oversight role, uh, the council should ensure that this historic opportunity for better, cheaper transportation for seniors and people's, uh, people with disabilities is not squandered for another decade. And I'm gonna turn now first to Jim, and then to Amy for uh, their comments, and, I, and you'll join in at the end. Uh, we're sort of here together, but you'll talk as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jim Weissman. I'm Executive Vice President and General Counsel of United Spinal Association. We used to be called Eastern Paralyzed Veterans Association, and when we were Eastern Paralyzed Veterans Association in 79, I sued New York City to make buses and subways accessible on behalf of people with disabilities, and it resulted in the creation of the Accessor Ride Program, too, because Mayor Koch, we sued just for buses and subways, but Mayor Koch was convinced by MTA that paratransit would be cheaper than making buses and subways accessible. And he said he could take everybody in New York City who was disabled on a paratransit trip whenever they wanted, wherever they wanted, for $9 million a year. I, they were setting up a duplicate transportation system, so it made no sense, but that is what they said. And it took five years of litigation to settle that case, and of course we got excess a ride because the mayor insisted on it. Right now, I heard them say the budget is $425 million. It's actually way higher than that. I think, I think it's about $60 a ride, not 50 and closer to 600 million. I'm not sure we're gonna have to 
get better numbers. I, I, I just want to point out that the numbers seem low, but the cost per ride is high no matter how you look at it. If you look at what's happened, MTA made a choice, which both the lawsuit and the most liberal Democrats in New York in 1984, uh, who supported people with disabilities, would only make key stations accessible. And ADA had to grandfather in MTA to get New York Democrats to vote for it. So the deal we made in 1984, which is 30 something years old, dictates that 100 key stations will be made accessible by 2020. There's 466 subway stations. Long haul transportation, therefore, becomes the responsibility of Accessoride because they keep eliminating interborough bus service. That's why Accessoride's costs are high. Uh, one of the reasons Accessoride's costs are high. The better Accessoride gets, the more demand there is. It's a vicious cycle. It's, gonna, it's, that, it's that kind of a service. So the, the real issues are how do you reduce cost per ride and how do you reduce demand? Feeder service, which people have complained about, I've heard a little bad talk about, feeder service actually turns people on to mass transit as well who don't use it. People using mass transit with a disability is, is a lot of it is a state of mind. Tom Charles said people with identical diagnoses, some can use mass transit and some can't. A lot of that is functional impairment and differences in functional impairment, but also confidence in using the system and relying on accessible equipment that might be broken and you get stranded in the subway and things like that. Right now, I see I'm out of time already, but r right now, um, if you, you can take, if you're taking a, a disabled person and is trained by the school system to use mass transit, if they're a disabled child, or is trained by MTA, which doesn't really exist, a training program, but the feeder service could be a de facto training program. If you use mass transit, you can reduce demand and increase capacity on accessory ride. The real way, though, to bring down cost per ride is to switch people, and we've been saying this for years to MTA, they're finally listening, is to switch people from expensive accessory ride services to less expensive accessible taxis and car services. They're out there anyway. They're purchased by somebody other than MTA. MTA buys the vehicles for its vendors for accessory. Taxis are purchased by private businesses, by entrepreneurial people who want to provide service. They're already providing some service for Medicaid. Ambulettes provide over $200 million worth of wheelchair user medical transportation trips in the five boroughs every year. All that could be switched from expensive ambulance services to cheaper car services and uh, uh, taxis, saving Medicaid healthcare dollars as well. So could all the other sponsored transportation like Department of Veterans Affairs, vocational rehabilitation. There's lots of benefits related travel for people with disabilities. All of that could be done cheaper in taxis. Therefore, it's important to create accessible taxi standards that people can depend on, feel are safe, can ride with others. And so I'm, I have a lot more in my written testimony, which I submitted. I want to uh, pass the microphone to Amy, who's going to talk about the vehicle itself. Hello. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, and thank you for the hearing opportunity for us to talk to you. As Joe and Jim have said, um, unusually, we have come together in a way to beg you to look at this taxi. Um, because we, as our communities have found, it does not work for our communities the way it is now. Uh, first, in terms of the people with disabilities community, as you know, there was a lawsuit, there was a settlement. Supposedly, the TLC was going to develop a wheelchair accessible vehicle. What they have proposed now is a vehicle that requires um, a rear entry, and that means if there's a rear entry, you're in traffic, but it also means that the only way a person and a wheelchair can get out of that vehicle is by backing out when they cannot see where they're going into the traffic. Um, the community has made its uh, concerns known and is seriously upset because that is not, their concerns are not being taken um, into consideration right now. As to the seniors, and I'm more familiar with seniors because I've been a professional and personal advocate on behalf of seniors for many, many years. 
the vehicle itself is, in a, is structured terribly for older individuals. And in the interest of time, I won't go into all the details. My written testimony is there, and I can provide additional inf information if you like. But asking seniors with frailty, with balance issues, with arthritis, with joint issues, who need canes, who need walkers, to go up two steps, especially when the step is small, or come down without any kind of real grab bar to hold on to, um, is a serious misunderstanding of what it's like to be aging and the typical common experiences of older individuals. The Comptroller, Scott Stringer, has written a letter to the TLC in February asking that um, our communities be more included in the understanding of how to develop and go forward with the TLC development, I mean the taxi development, and also suggested some contractual window opportunities that perhaps might um, be able to pursue some differences for our communities. And um, we are here to call on the committees to ask, please help us get a taxi that works for the seniors, that works for people with disabilities. We've heard how many times, and Jim has highlighted it further, that having an accessible taxi can be used as a supplemental vehicle, as a piggyback for other programs, but it won't work unless the vehicle is good for everybody and safe for everybody. Thank you. Just a quick point about the taxi design. It was designed to be an inaccessible taxi. And it won the Taxi of Tomorrow competition in its inaccessible form. Then we settled our lawsuit with Mayor Bloomberg uh, as he was going out the door from being mayor for 50% yellow cab accessibility by 2020, but they had already made the deal with Nissan. So that required the taxi to be manufactured. Nissan didn't retool in response to our settlement agreement. They're building the same inaccessible taxi they intended to build, shipping it from Mexico to Indiana and having it retrofit and at great cost which is paid for by a 30 cent fare increase that the de Blasio administration supported, and um, then sent to New York. There's one passenger in the back in a wheelchair and one other passenger space for just one other on the other side of the petition up front with the uh, driver. So it's a poor design and it would never have won the Taxi of Tomorrow competition if it was presented in the form that it's in now, because it's uh, not workable. If I just can add one more thing, my testimony talks about the fact that I've been, um, an individual has been brought to my attention who is seriously injured, a senior living independently, coming out of the vehicle, had trouble exiting. Not only um, has, does she have the injuries that I've mentioned, but she suffers from nightmares because it was such a traumatic experience for her. And this is heartbreaking and it's disrespectful for our seniors and I know the city can do better. Thank you. Now, do we have, uh, I mean, just curious, I mean, is there some model? I mean, other countries have a uh, fully accessible cap. I mean, are there some models that we can look at and say, hey, this is the one that we should be using in New York City? All right. uh, uh, there are uh, side entry uh, models that are available. Uh, London's, uh, the London cab, which probably couldn't be used in New York, is a side entry. There's a company called the MV1, or Mobi Mobility Ventures. They have a side entry uh, vehicle that actually you can see around the city now because I don't know if it came up uh, during uh, Tom's, uh, Tom sh did not come up like, apparently, uh, but the uh, MTA is using hundreds of these MV1 vehicles which have a side entry. They have enough space for a wheelchair users, user and three other passengers. Um, and uh, so they're on the market now. Um, you know, they're, uh, they, they cost more, just like most accessible vehicles at this point. Our goal is to make the accessible vehicle the standard vehicle so that, like the buses, one of the complaints about the buses, oh, it will cost too much to make them accessible. This is 30 years ago. Now, when you see a city bus, it's always accessible, yeah. and no one talks about the cost, and you don't call it an accessible bus, you call it a bus. That's what we foresee happening here in New York. There's a bill, intro uh, 749, I believe, that uh, Council Member uh, Johnson has in introduced that would require side entry, as we've uh, recommended, uh, getting rid of the rear entry and 100% accessibility in most of the taxi fleet. And we're 
we support that very, uh, very strongly. Great, thank you. Next. Good afternoon. My name is Miola V. McDonald. Thank you for this opportunity to speak before the committee today. I am representing the Senior Citizen and Health Committee of Community Board 12 in Queens. The members of the committee are from Housing Developments for Senior Citizens, Moderate Income Co-ops with high percentages of older adults, community-based organizations serving older adults, senior centers, health organizations, and community boards. One of the issues very important to us is Accessoride. We are grateful for this vital paratransit service supported by the City of New York. Some of our committee members are used, have used it for more than 15 years. Over the course of the past three years, customer service has declined tremendously. I'm sure you are aware of problems related to pickup and return times that have plagued the service since its inception. However, another area of concern has to do with the training of drivers for taxi and car services the city now contracts with. Simple acts of courtesy do not always translate culturally, culturally and therefore must be taught. Presently, drivers will, drivers will disembark a passenger on the other side of the street from where they were picked up, left to navigate wide boulevards using canes and other traveling devices. Drivers do not get out and open the door for an older adult passenger, entering or debarking. Some do not speak the English language adequately. If the driver is from another country, they are not attuned to the most basic of traveling courtesies to the extent one could interpret that actions and responses as racist. We feel training and proper monitoring should be part of the contract and not just contracted as a regular driver, taxi service with no responsibility regarding customer care, which is part and partial of services to individuals in need of services such as accessoride. Our committee was fortunate to have Councilman Dinick Miller to meet with us to discuss this need and on his suggestion, he thought the MTA, which has a state-of-the-art training department, would be ideal to train drivers of car and taxi services. It would begin to be a solution to the above issues. We request the Transportation Committee of the Council look into this and see if there is a possibility for this to happen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to this panel for your suggestions and your work on this issue, and we look forward to working with you on that. Uh, we also okay. been, uh, Councilmember Johnson returned back to us, and we were joined by Councilmember Royal earlier. Councilmember Johnson, you have something to add, or, okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to uh, engage with this panel. It's good to see you all. Uh, Jim, I just wanted to uh, go back to something that you had previously mentioned in your testimony, but also I believe in the question and answer uh, section you, you uh, mentioned as well. So the cost currently for Accessoride is $60 per ride, and that isn't per trip. That is one way. Is that correct? Right. So if someone is, lives in uh, Upper Manhattan and they need to go to downtown Brooklyn uh, and they need to get brought back, it's really $120. Yes. So the cost that the city is paying right now is enormous. And what do you think the estimate would be in making uh, all four hire vehicles, as my bill does, would the city end up saving money as it relates to that? I, I, I definitely think so, because you'd have, in a de facto way, the same way as MTA didn't propose accessible taxis or car services, but will use them if they exist, the more that's out there that runs cheaper than they do, the more they'll take advantage of it. Same with all other ride brokers for government-paying agencies. There's a huge threat however, which we didn't talk about, which is Uber, um, to the success of these accessible taxi programs. Uh, if you remember, three years ago, we got a bill passed in Albany that created the street hail program 
the green borough taxis, but also 20% of them had to be accessible. And it also was going to sell 2,000 new medallions to be placed only on accessible yellow cabs. They sold 400, and medallion values dropped like a rock because Uber has been so successful um, in taking market share away from yellows or, and perceived market share away from yellows. And the number of Uber vehicles, 100% of which are inaccessible, is a, a, as big as the taxi fleet now. So they can't sell new medallions because it would set a new low price for medallions. So those 1,600 more that was supposed to come in the next year or two aren't on our doorstep. So it's going to take longer to phase in accessible taxi service to begin with. And that will only be the yellows. Uber uses the greens in the boroughs. You can get, if you use the Uber app, you can get a green accessible taxi in the boroughs, but that's not available in Manhattan. In 1979, your organization uh, sued the MTA to create accessibility in subways and buses, and then there were uh, lawsuits after that with regard to the TLC for accessibility. Right. You all have worked on this for years, if not decades. Uh, I wanted to ask you, do you believe that the taxi of tomorrow, the Nissan model, actually is compliant with the American Disabilities Act? Well, you know, it's interesting because when we wrote the, t I was also on the committee to write the, the regulations for the uh, implementing regulations for transportation of ADA. At the time, it was 1991 when we wrote those regulations. There were no accessible factory-built cars and there were not virtually no accessible taxis in the United States. No one could imagine an accessible sedan. So what the regulation said was, is you, if you operate a van which seats less than eight, including the driver, seven passengers, it has to be accessible if you use it as a taxi. That has never been enforced in our city. So we have about 1,100, or a year or so ago, it was about 1,100, Dodge Caravans and Toyota Siennas that should have all been accessible because they're being used as taxis, which are not. Um, it would be uh, the Justice Department or an individual disabled plaintiff or plaintiff group that would have to bring that lawsuit. But TLC could have incorporated those into that into their rules, and they did not. So there's a, the, you have that problem. Now there is factory-built cars, at least one in, made in America, that's an accessible, purpose-built vehicle for a taxi. So I think it will change. But the box itself, the space, um, has never been defined for a taxi. How big does it have to be? But I will tell you, if you watch a wheelchair in the NV200, it's a tiny little back, the cargo area, uh, the, the back seat folds down, they enter from the rear, it's a tiny little box. The driver can barely move around in the box to strap the to secure the wheelchair user. It will be very difficult for them to do that. And I would say that it's at a minimum inconvenient and at worst very, very dangerous having them in the rear where, I mean, it's probably the most frequently hit place. I don't know, front fenders maybe are, I don't know. But rear enders are pretty common, I would think. And that if you look at where the passenger is in the NV200, they are sitting right there on, on the back of the car and right behind their head is the folded up ramp, uh, which when you, once a wheelchair user is in that car, there's a folded up ramp behind their head, only inches. So when there's a rear impact, I think it will be dangerous. So Those do vehicles you believe haven't been crashed. The taxi of tomorrow is a van? The NV200 is a van? It is a van. It should have been designed to be excessively. There was no litigation over that. When we settled the lawsuit with the Bloomberg administration, uh, we agreed to forego the van argument, which if we couldn't settle would have come up. But since they decided to make taxis accessible, we let it go. And if the taxi of tomorrow, if Nissan decided tomorrow we're going to uh, change the manufacturing of our vehicles from rear entry to side entry to make it safer for individuals that need it, would you think, do you think that that would then make the NV200 an acceptable vehicle? I don't know. I'd really have to see it to tell you. I know that it would be safer. It definitely would be safer. 
I, I, I still think it's a tight, small space and tough to work with, which is why they made it a rear entry vehicle in the first place. Braun, the company that's doing the conversion, are pros at this. They've been doing this for 30 years, maybe. So if you're an individual. And that's the best they could do with that van. If you're an individual who uses a wheelchair or a scooter or has some type of injury where you need an accessible vehicle to get around and we're not including um, accessoride and you live in uh, South Brooklyn and none of the uh, subway stations near you are accessible and there are no yellow cabs really out in your neighborhood because they're typically operating below 96th Street in Manhattan and the 20% of green cabs that are supposed to be accessible still haven't fully come online yet, and the number of black cars and Uber cars and Lyft cars and livery cars, there aren't that many that are accessible, but you need to get to your doctor's appointment uh, in Midtown Manhattan, or you need to go see a relative in uh, Northern Queens, you don't have many options. You're sort of stuck. There's one option. It's, it's a non-option, really, because of the price. Uh, you can call those private ambulats that take people on Medicaid trips. You can rent them. The, the guys that are the Medicaid carriers are rentable, but they cost hundreds of dollars each way. We had to bring a woman to a TV show from uh, Bensonhurst to Fox News, and uh, the uh, uh, and uh, it was $475 round trip. Wow. And in your testimony, you said that last year uh, Medicaid spent uh, $200 million, depending on if the person was Medicaid eligible, yes. to be able to get transport uh, for themselves. Right. And all that business could become livery business uh, in the boroughs and yellow care business in Manhattan if they were accessible. Well, thank you for your advocacy. I look forward to working with you and members of this committee on, uh, I think it's actually, frankly, embarrassing that in 2015, uh, if you're someone in New York City, I mean, we're hailing the fact that it's a big anniversary for the Americans with Disabilities Act. Well, our city has a long way to go to live up to its full promise under the ADA so that people that need certain types of services are treated with dignity and respect. Putting someone in the trunk of a car. Trunks are for luggage, not for people. And that is why I think we need to ensure that our for hire fleet in New York City is fully accessible, is safe, and treats people with the dignity and respect that they've deserved for many years and we still haven't achieved yet. Thank you, Madam your, Chair. Your bill will do it, will we'll permit spontaneous travel for the first time by, by people with disabilities. I didn't pay you to say that. <laughs> Um, thank you, Madam so Chair, for the ability. It's always been demand response. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the ability to uh, be part of this. Thank you, and thank you to the panel. Uh, next, we want to call up uh, Trips Philip Woods, Committee for Taxi Safety, Adihi Shaw, New York Lawyer for Public Interest, Kathleen Tree from Disabled Vets, Jean Ryan, Disabled in Action, and uh, Lindvidia Jacobson from the Alzheimer Association. Okay, someone else from the Alzheimer's Association. Matt Kudish? Okay.
Give it to the sergeant. Yes. Maybe we could use uh, the mic on the, um, the desk here in the front, Sergeant. Or we could use the table, too. They could just uh, sit up to the table. Yeah. Okay, I think we have accommodated everyone. Um, you want to start? The, maybe from this end? This is my husband, Martin Treat. He uh. is president of the Clinton Hell's Kitchen uh, Coalition Co for Pedestrian Safety. I, I think it's is wonderful. I don't use it. I have my own vehicle. I shouldn't be reimbursed. <clears throat> I take wow taxi when I need to. They're all accessible. It costs $30. I should be reimbursed. Why not reimburse people who have to take fully accessible cabs? It would be cheaper. Now, that's the end of accessibility as far as private vehicles. When I use the streets of Manhattan in my scooter, I Hazard every crossing, the curb cuts are a disaster, and they should be replaced by an entirely new system. And the buses to born in the snow are impossible. The MTA should be ashamed of their sidewalk care in snow. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Treat. Um, we agree with you. Uh, the curb cuts are important, and also with the snow, that we have to make sure that uh, where the stops are, that the snows are clear. 
and thank you for your suggestions. You're welcome. I'm Kathleen Treat. I'm chair of the Hell's Kitchen Neighborhood Association, and I'm married to this handsome guy. Martin is a Vietnam vet. He depends on the buses, the MTA buses, to get him to and from the VA hospital on 23rd Street. I would like to say one thing, two things actually. The, M the Accessor Ride would be helped a great deal if it had apps for passengers. Very, very simple. I don't think it requires a study. I don't think it requires 10 months, 12 months of discussion. They just got to do it. It's fabulous, that app. Um, I'd also like to put in a plug for the bus drivers in the MTA. We have found they are 100% cordial, kind, skilled. Kindness, maybe that's something you can teach people. I'm not sure. But uh, they're all union guys, and it's very disturbing to hear these remarks from people who rely on the accessor ride, which, thank God, we don't have to. Maybe, maybe making those drivers not uh, privatized through some other bizarre system, but just bring in good MTA union trained people. Thanks very much. Thank you for coming today, and really thank you for your testimony. I, I just want to, Madam Chair, thank uh, Martin and Kathleen Treat for being here today. They are pillars of the West Side community and Hell's Kitchen. Martin and I served on the community board together for eight and a half years. He still serves on the community board, and Kathleen is a key person in the neighborhood. I wanted to say this now because I have to actually leave and go to a meeting, but I'm deeply grateful that they're here, and thank you for all of your hard work and continued advocacy. Thanks. It's Corey. In Manhattan. Yes. Pardon? If you're lucky, you live in Manhattan. Yeah, we are. Okay, uh, next. My name is Jean Ryan. Is this on? Okay. I'm from Disabled in Action and Taxis for All campaign. This DIA is a civil rights organization. Uh, <clears throat> this, this hearing is not just about seniors traveling. It's about people with disabilities, and people with disabilities are of all ages and need to get around, you know, wherever they need to go. So, um, you know, it's, it's important to keep that in mind. As, especially since probably the younger you are, the more you want to go places. And <clears throat> it's not right that a lot of us are really stuck in our houses and the night service is so bad that you really think twice before you go out at night because getting back home is going to be a problem. There aren't very many drivers. There's not very many companies that drive at night. And, of course, there's reduced demand, but it's really... I can pretty much be guaranteed of a hassle if I'm out past 8 o'clock at night. That's ridiculous, you know? I, I've, I'm an active person, and I like to go places. And so do a lot of other people. So uh, what we need is options. We can't just have excess ride. We can't just have the buses because the express buses, the drivers are not necessarily nice. They're not necessarily trained to take people on... Uh, people with wheelchairs and know how to use a lift or care about knowing it. And it's, it's just so frustrating that I absolutely cannot count. I'm that person in South Brooklyn that Corey Johnson talked about. I cannot count on taking the express bus in ever into the city because it might take hours to get on one. That's ridiculous. And it only runs every hour anyway most of the time. So, you know... Th the training, the, the, even the interest in putting us on the bus is really, on those express buses, is very, very low interest from the MTA. And I can make a complaint, and I get a, a, the same letter back every single time with no change. It's not a personalized letter. It's a, you know, it, it says the same thing. Um, so 
And Excess Ride is mandated to be a provider of emergency transportation for people with disabilities when there's a large emergency and it's declared by the city or the state. But what about all of our individual emergencies where our equipment breaks down, our battery dies, our caster breaks off, our motor stops? There, there is nothing that we can do about that. And I think Excess Ride should be mandated to provide same-day service for people when their equipment totally breaks down because we have no way to get anywhere then, you know, if, our, if we have broken equipment. Um, I'll, I'll be really quick on the rest of it. The broker service is like the Wild West. There are so many complaints about it. I'm thankful I don't have to use it <laughs> because I can't get into those cars. So that's why I, can't, I don't have to use it. Um, when people are get threatened with suspensions, oftentimes the, there's like a no-show on there that they had nothing to do with, that, wasn't, that they were there, and you know, it's wrong, it's uh, inadvertent, or their disability prevented them from taking a ride that day, or something that they couldn't stop from happening. And when people successfully um, appeal the suspension, and when it's still held against them in the future, like the, people can look it up on the computer from Access Ride and see that it was there, and then they say, well, that person, you know, already had a lot of no-shows, even when they successfully appealed it. So I am suggesting that those, that if you successfully a, appeal an excess, a suspension, that it gets stricken from the record that you c it can't be held against you in the future, which it shouldn't be if you successfully appeal it. And nobody ever brings that one up. So uh, the other thing is that um, the certification centers, I only go every five years, but every e the last two centers I've been to have had a lot of privacy concerns and inaccessibility. And, you know, I only, we only have to go every five years. But that shouldn't be. There shouldn't be any privacy problems there. You shouldn't. I, I, the last one, I couldn't even get into the room because there wasn't enough room to close the door between the person that I was talking to and me. And um, then she wanted to meet out in the hallway. That's not private. That's a HIPAA concern. And it's also just a concern about accessoride and recertification or certification in the first place. Uh, and the. Uh, the, uh, the last thing, well, two things. Language access is a huge problem. I hardly ever see anybody on the van who doesn't speak English fluently, probably because they can't get the service and, or, or, or get a ride. And the last thing is the IVR notification of, that the vehicle is coming. We can get it by text, email, or um, phone, but it's so inaccurate, it's wildly inaccurate especially when the van is going to be late. The van might be an hour late or more, and we'll get, uh, we, we might get something. We never get something saying it's going to be late. We'll get something saying it's going to come in 10 minutes, and then it doesn't. You know, it comes in an hour, or we get nothing, and the dispatchers do not call us. It is so rare to get any kind of a call from a dispatcher saying that the van is br broke down or some other van has to come. So. That is really hard on us. People, you heard people testifying how difficult it is to stand and wait. Well, it's also difficult to sit and wait because we can't go to the bathroom, we can't leave, we have to be there because if the van does show up or the vehicle, we have to be out there. And we, we don't know how long it's going to be. We can't go get food, nothing. So this, that needs to be improved. It's not the greatest thing that there ever was. Thank you. Thank you. Next. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the issues of transportation services for seniors and people with disabilities in New York City. My name is Matt Kudish. I'm Senior Vice President of Caregiver Services at the New York City Chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. Founded in 1978, the chapter is one of seven statewide and 83 nationally that deliver services and provide care and support free of charge. The New York City chapter serves an estimated 500,000 New Yorkers annually, those with Alzheimer's and related disorders, as well as their caregivers. 
Alzheimer's is a progressive and fatal brain disease, mostly affecting the elderly, which threatens to overwhelm the health care system if we do not find a way of preventing or hopefully curing it one day. Approximately 5 million people in the United States are currently living with Alzheimer's, and we estimate that 5 percent reside here in New York City. Every 67 seconds, a person in the United States develops Alzheimer's. We expect by 2030 there will be 7 million people aged 65 and older living with Alzheimer's. And by 2050, in less than 40 years, that number can reach 16 million Americans. The financial ramifications of the disease are daunting and currently cost America $214 billion annually. Today, an estimated 250,000 people in New York City are living with dementia or Alzheimer's, and they're experiencing losses that are unimaginable to those of us who do not suffer from this illness. This debilitating disease not only robs persons of dementia of their memory, but also causes problems with thinking and behavior severe enough to adversely impact nearly every aspect of their daily lives. The person with the disease is no longer able to work, enjoy lifelong hobbies, or social life. The lives of their family members are profoundly affected as well. They become increasingly isolated as their caregiving responsibilities escalate. Alzheimer's and other dementias are one of the leading causes of dependency and disability in older adults. Uh, today's hearing is focused on transportation services. This morning's testimony from Tom Charles of the MTA included a lot of talk of compliance. I think being in compliance is certainly better than not, but compliance as a goal sets a pretty low bar. How wonderful it would be to strive for better and to aim to blow minimum standards out of the water. My testimony will address the accessory program from the perspective of our clients who are living with early stage Alzheimer's disease. And in just a few minutes, you'll have the opportunity to hear from our client, Lynn Bonia Jacobson, who is a caregiver for her husband, Manny, who is currently living with Alzheimer's. Resources for the people living with early stage are incredibly limited throughout the city. The New York City chapter offers programs specifically designed for this population, which take place at our Midtown Manhattan office. We're grateful for the Accessoride program because without it, many of our clients would simply be unable to attend. However, the clients who utilize the program often experience, if you'll forgive the pun, a bumpy ride. If I were to categorize the issues for early stage clients who are uh, they're experiencing, the primary theme would be communication challenges, followed by a lack of meaningful training in a number of ways. People living with early stage Alzheimer's are experiencing short-term memory loss, changes in their ability to communicate effectively, and impaired judgment. However, they are able to function independently in myriad ways. We encourage them to do so. However, they must be set up for success from rude dispatchers and drivers to errors on pickup times and locations, to late arrivals to destinations to complete no-shows, our clients are met with difficulties nearly every time they rely on Accessoride. The use of unmarked vehicles is another significant stressor for our clients. Appropriately marked vehicles are easy for them to identify. All too often, however, we find vehicles are unmarked. This means a vulnerable adult is approaching countless unmarked vehicles in an attempt to locate the vehicle that's there to take them home. Imagine what will happen if they get in the wrong one. To increase and improve access to New York City's transportation services for older adults and the disabled, the Alzheimer's Association recommends the following. Require and ensure that all vehicles clearly display easy-to-read signage at all times. Allow vehicles to utilize bus lanes in order to pick up and drop off passengers at their intended address. Require sensitivity training to the needs of older adults and disabled. And be, uh, the accessorized staff should also be trained to better understand Alzheimer's and related dementia specifically so they can better address the needs of people living with dementia who rely on them. The implementation of the use of or expansion of covert passengers to assist in evaluation performances would also be beneficial. And the New York City chapter of the Alzheimer's Association stands ready to provide expert guidance and assistance in considering these manners. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next. <clears throat> Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share with you my recent experiences with Accessoride. My name is Limbania Jacobson, and for 55 years, I have been married to Emmanuel Jacobson. We have been using the Accessoride service from April 4th, 2012 to the present. Let me say up front, this is a wonderful, we are very fortunate to have this wonderful service. However, improvements are sorely needed, and my purpose here today is to illustrate some major glitches in the service. Since October 2002, my now 85-year-old husband has been suffering with Alzheimer's disease, 
and has also developed Parkinson's disease, is incontinent and wheelchair bound due to a blockage in his legs. Our life in Manhattan's Upper West Side and his living at home would not be possible without the accessory transportation service. Neither would his frequent visits to multiple physicians, keeping monthly dental appointments, and attending weekly rehearsals with the Unforgettables, which is a choral group composed of people with dementia and their caregivers. Not participating nor participating in special museum programs designed for this population. These are important activities that greatly contribute to keeping his brain active. I'm trying with all the strength and energy in my 78-year-old body to keep him out of a nursing home. Physically and mentally, his 24-hour care is a strenuous job that leaves me exhausted at the end of the day. Emotionally, it's a labor of love. I rely on available New York services to keep us together at home, living out our remaining years as best we can. So to us, these accessorite issues are the difference between being apart and my caring for him at home with the limited health of a four hours a day home health aid. Let me tell you how a typical day goes. If we have a medical appointment at 1 p.m., I call Accessori two days in advance at 7 a.m. to schedule a pickup for 11.30 a.m. to travel from West 89th Street to West 168th Street. The alarm goes off at 6.30 a.m. It takes one hour to wake him up, another two hours to get him out of his electric hospital bed, bathed and dressed, one and a half hours to eat breakfast, and another 30 minutes to get him into his coat. So we can sit and wait in the building lobby for pickup by accessoride. Although our instructions were to be outside, even when the weather could be bitter cold, snowing, sleeting, raining, or of extreme heat and humidity. If we are lucky, the van might arrive within the 30 minute scheduled pickup time frame. If our van is coming from Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx, or even from downtown, the wait is going to be longer, well past the 30 minute window. But we don't know that because after waiting the required 30 minutes, when I call the dispatcher, I'm told, the car is on its way to you. When I ask about the van's location, the, often is, the, the answer is often, I can't tell you that because the driver doesn't have a GPS. And so we sit and wait an undetermined length of time. After being picked up, the driver may have another passenger who has also been waiting a long time, or one who may not be immediately available, as was the case recently. At the direction of the dispatcher, we waited 30 minutes in the van for a passenger who did not show. When we arrived late for his appointment, the physician also sees us later in the day, and I must reschedule the return trip home because it was based on a pickup time frame that's no longer applicable. When I call the dispatcher for a new pickup time, I'm told to call when we are ready to leave. So we must now wait at least another hour to an hour and a half for our ride home, longer if the driver has another pickup or drop off that may be in another borough. You'll hear more about this later on. It could take up to six or seven hours before we return to our home after an appointment, and worst of all, my husband has been sitting in his waist, not eating food or drunk any fluids because the car can arrive at any minute. And if we have gone to the bathroom, we could miss our ride and neither eating nor drinking are allowed in the van. In the limited time I have here today, I would like to describe a few events that have happened to us between December and, De December and March of this year. If it was once, well, I understand, things happen. But when it happens repeatedly, 
then it's a major systems problem. Early last December, my husband was banned from using taxi authorizations. When I called eligibility to inquire why, I was told, and I quote, <clears throat> you have abused the system with excessive rides. You are to use shared rides like everyone else. And then I heard, bang, as the person hung up the telephone. I immediately appealed to the office of City Council Member Helen Rosenthal and met with a member of her staff who called Accessoride and was told the same thing. When asked how excessive rides are determined and defined and by whom, no answer was forthcoming. The fact is, in the Accessoride handbook, there is no criteria defining excessive rides nor a statement of how this decision is made, nor by whom. Furthermore, no one called or wrote us a letter for warning us of the impending suspension. The staffer was also told that my husband would receive a letter explaining all. As of yesterday, April 22nd, four months later, the letter has yet to arrive. Meanwhile, the first time we, we have he ever heard from Accessoride was early April, apologizing for, and I quote, the inconvenience that this has caused regarding a missed connection that occurred back in March. The driver claimed he was at the pickup point, although I was standing in front of it as I spoke with the dispatcher and the van was not there. Ms. But Jacobson, can you... Uh sum up because I know it's a very long testimony and we appreciate it but we have a copy of it because we still have a lot of people waiting to testify. Okay, I will jump the, directly to my recommendations at the end. If you would bear with me, I would greatly appreciate it. I waited a long time for this opportunity to testify here today and this is of critical importance to me and my husband. Uh, one is assign drivers uh, fixed routes so they can become familiar with streets, traffic patterns, and customers who frequent the same addresses. This would contribute greatly to competing trips on time. Two, allow greater time between pickups. Currently, they are spaced too closely together. Three, group riders being picked up at the same location who are traveling to the same neighborhood let them know in advance of this time-saving convenience. Grouping of passengers might be possible at museums and medical appointments. Four, provide an app riders can download to smartphones so they can track the location of their vehicles. This will greatly reduce frequent phone calls to dispatchers inquiring about location of the car. Five, provide an uh, accessoride payment cards similar to the metro card used on subways and buses. This would be both a time saver and provide an accurate record of passenger pickup and drop off time. Six, state very clearly accessoride's policy on the use of taxi authorizations. There's more to that and I'll let you read that. Seven, grant greater flexibility flexibility in scheduling end of medical and dental appointment pickup times. One never knows when a visit to a health provider will be completed. Eight, provide drivers with clear descriptions of handicapped pickup sites when they are not located at the street address listed on the manifest. Nine, consider granting automatic taxi authorizations for short trips within the same borough. It could greatly contribute to lengthening wait time. Ten, update the trip reservation software to include taxi authorizations for wheelchairs. Presently, the block in the system must be overridden by a supervisor. Again, I want to thank you for the time you have given me to listen to my concerns and I look forward to seeing improvements in the accessoride system. Thank you very much for your testimony. Next. Good afternoon. My name is Aditi Shah, and I thank Chairpersons Chin, Cohen, and Rodriguez for convening this oversight hearing today. New York Lawyers for the Public Interest is a civil rights law firm that has a long-standing disability rights practice. And among the various issues that we work on, we work with at least dozens of individuals each year who are trying to apply for and or use the accessoride service. 
Unfortunately, through our work, we've identified two key problems that are blocking otherwise eligible people from even being able to get on the service. First is that their assessment process that AccessRide uses uh, is really one in which the applicants have the odds stacked against them. And second is that the appeals process really lacks impartiality and adequate due process protections. These are issues of particular concern given that in recent years, AccessRide's denial rate has more than doubled in terms of its eligibility determinations. So turning first to the uh, application process, there are really three key problems that we've identified over the course of working with many clients and getting freedom of information requests related to their individual cases. First is that the assessment process uh, is ill-fitted for many disabilities, many people with different types of disabilities. Second is that Accessoride, uh, through its assessment process, really ignores oftentimes the most relevant proof of the person's eligibility. And finally, we find that applicants find themselves in a catch-22 situation. So in terms of the ill-fittedness of, of the assessment process, particularly for people who have what we'd call invisible disabilities, such as psychiatric disabilities, relying on physical testing, such as walking up and down the hallway or, or walking up a set of mock bus steps, is far from relevant and far from representative of what their limitations are when they're actually trying to use the bus or the subway. Unfortunately, this is exactly what Accessoride does. And to the extent that Accessoride has a psychologist interview the person at their assessment, it's really, as, again, as the FOIL records clearly show, a brief, maybe 10-minute interview that focuses on the person's mood and ability to answer questions in that particular setting. But it does absolutely nothing to elicit how those person's disabilities really manifest when they're trying to use the subway or the bus. Which leads to the second problem, which is that Accessoride routinely ignores what is really often the most relevant information, taking the same example of a person with psychiatric disabilities who submits a concrete and detailed letter from their treating physician who can really attest to all of these things. But again, as we've seen in many cases, this is routinely ignored or dismissed or minimized. And again, the pattern that we've seen across many clients um, is that the Transit Authority or Accessoride uses really what's uh, the same pattern of reasons for denying people. And it, what we find is that people are really in an impossible situation. If they attempt to do the assessment uh, and are unable to do it because their, their disabilities you know, limit them from being able to walk the full distance, for example, they're uh, blamed for having refused or failed to complete the assessment. If they're forced to stop in the middle, um, and I will just wrap up briefly, if they're forced to stop in the middle uh, because of their particular limitations, they're faulted for exaggerating their conditions, and these are all written in their records. We've brought several Article 78 proceedings to challenge these denials uh, for their arbitrariness, and we've had some success doing that, but certainly individuals should not have to be forced to jump through legal hoops to get certified for this service. And just quickly, in terms of the appeals process, um, given all of these underlying re you know, problems that are in the assessment, what we really find is that there's a lack of neutrality in the appeals process itself. The appeal, appeal hearings excuse me, are conducted much more like cross-examinations than an impartial decision maker actually reviewing uh, what the situation is. And second, the, uh, the appellants are given really no access to information. The denial letters that they receive from Accessoride are basically checked boxes identical from one applicant to the next, and they have no access to their records. They would have to file a freedom of information request to even get access to those records. Most people don't even know that that's an option, and to the extent that people do, it often takes much longer to get those records than the time allows in the appeals process. Um, so I'll conclude here, but in uh, my written testimony, we've included a list of some recommendations that uh, we think if Accessoride in incorporated those suggestions, then we could help strengthen and make this a much more fair process that, again, doesn't feel like the applicants have the odds stacked against them and that eligible people aren't uh, unable to, to navigate that process. Thank you very much for your time. Next. Good afternoon. My name is Tweeps Phillips Woods, and I'm the executive director of the Committee for Taxi Safety. And on behalf of the committee, we'd like to thank you for hosting this oversight hearing on accessibility in New York City transport. The committee represents licensed New York City taxi agents, managing approximately 20% of the yellow medallion vehicles in New York City. And through those agents, more than 5,000 drivers who drive tens of thousands of passengers a day. We want to thank Council Member Corey Johnson for introducing legislation last week that would provide 100% accessibility for all licensed TLC vehicles. We also believe that all major modes of transportation overseen by the City of New York should be accessible. 
True accessibility requires that the entire transportation industry regulated by the city be accessible. Having only a few segments of the transportation industry be held to this standard not only fails to achieve the goal of true accessibility, but is also arbitrary. Making this requirement universal with a quicker turnover time would ensure that all New Yorkers receive the same service. This is a basic civil right. A person who uses a wheelchair should have the opportunity for the same service as anyone else and should be able to take advantage of all the innovations in the automotive world. By broadening the accessibility mandate to all forms of transportation in New York City, we can rank ourselves among cities like London, Washington, D.C., and Montreal that have already implemented superior accessible requirements. I want to thank you for this opportunity to speak to you today about this important topic, and we'd be happy to work with you further on this issue. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Shah, I was wondering, uh, you heard the testimony of the MTA. They said, I believe it was something like 78 percent of the applicants are approved. Uh, however, they said that on, if you were denied, you, your chances on appeal were very poor. Do you, do you contest the underlying numbers? Do you think that those numbers are accurate? The numbers that, that I have are from a state controller's report from last year, from 2014, which shows that the appeal, at the appeal level, the denial rate is still 80 percent. So 80 percent of the, basically, the decisions to deny people are upheld. Um, so I think there may be a little bit of a discrepancy, but we're certainly concerned that to the extent people are trying to go through this process and, again, don't really even have access to the information underlying their denial, they're just really not given a fair shake at even, you know, trying to, to challenge that. What about on the initial application process where there, I think the agency said that something like 78 percent of the people who apply are approved. Do you think those numbers are, are, are they reflective of your experience? Uh, from what I can tell you from my clients, I, I'm surprised to hear that number. It seems like we get many, many calls about from people who, and these aren't even just people who are applying for the first time, it's people who've been on the service for 8, 12 years who call us and say, I don't know what's going on. Suddenly I was kicked off. I have the same disabilities. In fact, they're worse now. I have my documentation. I went through the appeals and what's going, what's going on. Um, so th that number is very surprising to me and does not match my experience. Thank you for your testimony. Okay. We want, thank you to this panel for coming in to testify. And we're going to call the next panel. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mariella Austin, uh, Michael Davoli, Anne DeShazo, and Ellen Garman. Please. My name is Ellen Gorman. I'm a resident of Manhattan. I'm a 75-year-old disabled woman living in and contributing to the city, living alone for 45 years. At one point, I was um, chair of a uh, Council on the Aging in Southern Brooklyn. I'm a social, retired social worker and now I'm advocating for myself after having advocated for others all my life. I would like to thank the council members, all the council members, not only for calling this meeting and these hearings, but also for the questions they have asked. The questions have been discerning and persistent and they need to be so. Uh, because the answers are not always forthcoming, unfortunately. Uh, I would like to speak to two issues, one briefly that has already been spoken to, and that's the uh, Taxi of Tomorrow, which is on the streets now, 
and which I cannot get into unless I am pushed and pulled, which I have been subjected myself to because I have felt I have had no other choice. This is clearly dangerous. I have asked drivers, my own sample only, uh, how people feel about this taxi of tomorrow. They told me, well, 80 percent like it, about 20 percent uh, don't like it and can't use it. Well, liking it and disliking it are one thing. Not being able to use it is a different thing. That's 20 percent of the population on the street who are trying to use this taxi. And that means disabled people on the street cannot use it, which seems kind of silly since it's for the street. Uh, I would also like to speak to an issue that's been alluded to but perhaps not experienced as intensely as I have, and that is the use of taxis by Accessoride and the ability of a client of the service to use taxis. Uh, I have been able to use them for three months, and then I was blocked when I called uh, to make my appointment. Nobody knew why I was blocked. I called my council person, then Christine Quinn, uh, and um, they received no answer, um, except that after a certain amount of time, I was not allowed to use it. Uh, I called this year because of something I received in the mail after having used taxis only the past three years and paying for them myself, $600 to $800 a month, which is a lot of money. Uh, and I was told the same thing as before. Um, you have to use our regular services, our being accessoride, if you want to use the taxi. How much time, I asked, for each? What was the percentage of taxis? What was the percentage of accessoride vans or other transport? They said to me they couldn't tell me um, and that they would not sign off on those taxis. Two, two days ago, I was at a meeting at the borough president's office, a meeting of her advisory board for the aged with a representative from Accessoride, who said clearly the taxis are half the cost of the regular Accessoride ride. And under those circumstances, they would not allow me to use taxis regularly because it was, quote, unquote, a personal service. And um, clearly he had no uh, empathy for the disabled, has no idea what the life of the disabled person is like, uh, and even said when asked the mandate of Accessoride from the Federal Disabilities Act, that the mandate was to provide transpa transportation that is quote unquote comparable to that of the able bodied, not equal to it. In New York State, it's a clearly stated policy that the disabled are to receive the estimation of comparable services to the disabled, set by people who know nothing about the life of chronic disability. That seems to me a shame in New York City. I titled my testimony New York is a disabled, unfriendly city, and that is how I've experienced it, unfortunately. On the street, people do not help you. There is no taxi etiquette or public services announcement. People run ahead of you constantly. They do not help you. The only people who help you are older women, who probably have a lot more empathy. There should be some public service announcements ab about the rights of the disabled on the street. Uh, I have other pieces in my testimony, but I think I've made my points, and I'd like to turn it over to the next person. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Michael DeBoli. I represent the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. We are the nonpartisan, nonprofit advocacy affiliate of the American Cancer Society. Um, we are very pleased to, uh, to have an opportunity to speak to the committee today and appreciate all of your leadership on this issue. Um, I'm actually going to, uh, I'm going to very much abbreviate my testimony. A lot of what we would like to talk about has actually been said uh, in terms of all the accessoride stuff. But what I would like to do is bring another element into this discussion, uh, and that is 
how cancer patients relate to transportation issues in New York City with a special focus on seniors and those with disabilities. Every single year in New York City, 36,000 people will hear the words, you have cancer. And when you hear those words, there's two things that occur. A flood of emotions comes over you and a flood of questions comes into your mind. Emotions from fear and, 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 and anger take over. And questions from, you know, what does this mean? Am I going to live? What will happen to my family? What's the best treatment? All come rushing in, and there's nothing else you can think about. But unfortunately, one of the questions that people never really think about, but is often a deciding factor in whether or not a patient gets to the treatment that gets the treatment that they need and gets the act and gets the support that they need is the simple question of how will they get to their doctor's appointments how will they get to their chemotherapy treatments two three times a week often cancer patients have a choice they can get a ride from their, their, you know, their children, their friends, their family. They can try to maneuver the buses. They can try to maneuver the subways. If they're age eligible or if they're, uh, or if they're eligible, they can, they can use Accessoride. Many of these choices, though, are out of their control. And asking a cancer patient who is already physically weak and mentally weak to potentially maneuver the public transportation system is something that no one would ask of their own family member. Yet, the limitations put on cancer patients in their ability to get access to things like Accessoride cause them to have to make some of these very decisions. The American Cancer Society spends a tremendous amount of resources every single year providing support services to help cancer patients get to treatments all across the state of New York. But out of 6,400 calls that we receive every single year for assistance in getting a patient to the doctor's office, we are only able to respond to 20% of all of those because we simply don't have the volunteers or the resources necessary to fulfill all of the requests. So the last thing I just want to say is of that 36,000 cancer patients diagnosed every year in New York City alone, 80% of them live in the outer boroughs outside of Manhattan. Yet the vast majority of cancer centers and the vast majority of oncologists live, or excuse me, work in Manhattan, which means for a cancer patient to get into a life-saving treatment, it can take well over an hour to an hour and a half just to get to those appointments. So I just would like to, wanted to add that level of discussion and thank the committee for their leadership, and we look forward to partnering with you in the future. Sorry. Good afternoon. My name is Ann DeShazo. I'm the Director of Visions Services for the Blind and Visually Impaired, located in Chelsea. Visions is an, innovative ser an innovator of service delivery, and we strive to meet the needs of New York City's youths, adults, and seniors living with vision loss. Visions provides free services for low-income, multi-disabled, and ethnically diverse individuals and families. We focus on assisting our seniors with vision loss, with developing and maintaining healthier lifestyles, providing an atmosphere that encourages social connections, ensuring they all receive information in their format of choice, and can ask, access counseling and support. Visions provides nutritious meals, opportunities for physical activity, education seminars, adapted technology training, photography, and sculpture, sculpture classes, and so much more. Visions is an 88-year-old nonprofit organization and provided free services to over 6,000 individuals, giving us direct and extensive experience of how Accessoride service impacts our clients. More than half of Visions clients are over 60 and the majority have low incomes. Through funding from the New York Department for the Aging and New York City Council members, Visions Senior Center has registered over 600 participants in a caregiver support program 
a, a caregiver support program that has an enrollment of over 750 individuals. There is an ongoing and growing need for transportation services for seniors with vision loss. It is important to note that we have hundreds of participants that use Accessoride and we have Visions employees and interns with Visions that also use Accessoride services. Accessoride is an important service for people who need to get to work, attend medical appointments, and be active participants in their treatment programs. Our main objections to the current Accessoride program is the unreliability clients, interns, and staff members are expressing to us their issues with getting stuck and trying to get home after excessive time and also the excessive time spent in vans traveling to and from their destinations. Below are just a few quotes that we've obtained from employees and also interns and our seniors that sort of exhibit some of the problems that are being experienced with accessorides. You can't rely on them to pick you up on time. There's no way to use GPS to locate the drivers anymore. I experienced dispatchers telling me the driver will arrive in five or ten minutes and it's, an over, it's over an hour later. I think drivers need some formal training on how to work with people who are disabled, especially people with vision loss. Drivers need to pay more attention to, address, to the addresses when picking people up. I live in a complex with multiple buildings and numbers and the drivers are consistently pulling up to the wrong building or entrance complaining that I am not at the right location. I am an elderly woman and I can't deal with the shared rides that are extremely long. I've had many experiences in which drivers pick people up after me and drop them off first, making me late to my appointments. It might be helpful if the dispatcher plans the routes better and everyone can get to their destinations as close to their times as possible. One example came from a woman who was picked up from Queens at 7 a.m. She was coming to Visions. Her support group started at 10.30. It ended at 11.45, and she didn't get there till almost 11.45. One of our intern students shared a recent story where he was scheduled to be picked up at 4.30 at our Greenwich Street office location, but received a call the same day letting him know that he needed to take an earlier pickup of 3.30, otherwise Accessoride could not guarantee when he would be picked up or when he would get home. And one last final quote from another person stated, if I were over an hour late to work every day, I would be fired. While currently, a pilot program in, uh, while currently a pilot program in just two city neighborhoods, we strongly recommend that the Taxi Smart Card program or something similar should be made permanent and expanded citywide immediately, allowing eligible accessory customers to use yellow or green taxis and or for hire vehicles for their travels allow for the maximum flexibility to serve an individual's transportation needs and has proven to offer significant time and cost savings. This program offers a more fully integrated experience, enabling seniors with vision loss to hail or e hailed a taxi, care, taxi cab or car, thus avoiding long waits, avoid the need to schedule in advance, and avoid missed pickups by accessoride vans. I would like to thank, to thank all the council committee members for allowing me an opportunity to comment on such an important service, an important service. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Marietta Austin, and I use Accessoride, and I have two concerns. One is the automated phone call that we get notifying us that the driver will be there in 11 minutes, 13 minutes, which usually ends up being 30 minutes to an hour. Um, I have questioned where exactly the phone calls are coming from, whether they're coming from MTA, whether they're coming from the dispatchers, whether they're coming from the driver. I'm told that they come from MTA, I'm told they come from the driver, because if the driver is sending the message, he knows he's not 11 minutes away. He knows he's not 15 minutes away. He knows he's 30 minutes away, so just say you're 30 minutes away. Why? Because I go outside and I wait for you thinking you're coming in 10 minutes and I'm actually standing outside for 30, 40 minutes and I cannot stand long. So what happens is by the time I get home, I'm in more pain than when I left in the morning. So all I can do is go home and get in bed. My second concern is the advisory committee, that there is no transparency. Um, and if these individuals are actually advocating on behalf of passengers, how do they know the concerns of the passengers if they don't hear from the passengers? 
So I'm hoping that as a result of today's meeting, that committee will be addressed. Um, people will know exactly what they do, who's on the committee, how we can address that committee and our concerns. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. I, I, just, have a, I just have a comment. Uh, after today's hearing, um, we're going to be writing a letter to the MTA to get information about who's on this advisory group and how can uh, you know, more advocacy group participate and also how they interact uh, with the community. So we definitely will be doing that. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for being here today. Okay, the next panel is uh, Christina Rhodes, Agnes Amadean, Abraham, uh, Michael McMahon, Michael, oh, Michael, how do you say it? O'Loughlin. O'Loughlin, thank you. Please. Well, good afternoon, um, Chairs Cohen and Chin, and uh, thank you for hosting this uh, oversight hearing to allow us to bring about some issues uh, for transportation that are affecting wheelchair users in the city of New York. Um, so thanks again. We really appreciate your time today. My name is Christina Rhodes, and I am a T5 paraplegic as a result of a spinal cord injury when I was young. And as you can see, I use a manual wheelchair to get around and have as long as I can remember. Um, it happened just when I was 10 months old, a complete injury from domestic violence. And um, I, I'm here to say, though, that I am in, in love with the life that I live and very comfortable in the body that I have. But um, it's important to, to speak up so, so positive change can happen. Um, in addition to being a motivational speaker and a consultant and a, a mother and a wife, I'm also a marketing professional for the world's first ever purpose-built from the factory wheelchair accessible vehicle called the Mobility Ventures MV1. And they mentioned it a little bit earlier today, Jim Wiseman and, and some of his colleagues. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that today and kind of fill you in on what that vehicle is all about. Uh, Mobility Ventures created the MV1 specifically to meet and exceed the guidelines and requirements of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, Mobility Ventures is owned by the longtime military vehicle manufacturer, AM General, which some of you may be familiar with, and MV1s are built in a 100% union-operated um, plant, assembly plant in Mishawaka, Indiana, and the MV1 also um, meets the U.S. DOT's Buy America requirements. So a little bit about the accessibility of the car, because that's really what's most important. The fact that it's built from the ground up is, is really a big deal, because there's a lot of thoughtful design in the vehicle, and it works how somebody like me wants it to work. It features the side entry in-floor ramp that comes out, and I'm able to wheel right up and into the spacious interior with my luggage or whatever I may have, um, and with the choice of either sitting in the passenger position or transferring out of my wheelchair and to some of the other spacious seats that are inside the vehicle. Um, as someone who really values my independence and someone that has had to work hard and to gain and maintain that independence, I'm proud to say that the MV1 allows me to get out on my own in this world, and not only on my own, but on my own terms, without asking me to sacrifice personal safety or dignity. It's important that, that you guys are aware that there are over 60,000 individuals who use wheelchairs, scooters, other mobility aids that reside here in the five boroughs. 
Um, as somebody who travels very often for my job, um, as well as for personal reasons, I, I travel all across the U.S. And I want to commend um, New York City for their advancements in the 50 percent accessible taxi ruling by 2020 um, with the Accessoride program with uh, over 2,000 vehicles, um, which almost a fifth of our MV1s today in the side entry vehicles that are easily accessed. Um, but there is still a, a ways to go. And from a personal experience, somebody that travels into the city very often and ha has to rely on public transportation and taxis to get around, um, we, we still have some, some movement to make. Most of the, as you heard earlier, most of the accessible taxis in New York City um, are rear entry. So they feature a rear entry ramp, which means it's a minivan that is modified. They lower the floor, they put a ramp in the back, and I'm literally um, wenched up into the trunk of the vehicle next to the spare tire. Um, if I'm riding with anybody, whether it be my colleagues, friends, or if I try to venture out with my three-year-old daughter um, into the world, they would be completely separated from me in the vehicle, possibly in the front seat if the luggage is in the, the seat in front of me. Um, and then, as they mentioned earlier, I've got a metal ramp folded up inches behind my head. And then I, I want to talk for just a moment, I know, know my time's up, about the general nature of a minivan. So let's think about the trunk space and what that is intended for. They, they call it the crumple zone because that's the, the area of a minivan, of a car, that is intended to collapse when there's a rear impact collision um, so the passengers are safe. And this is where I'm riding after the back bumper and all the structural support has been removed to put the ramp in. Um, so that's, that's an issue, and it, it's pretty scary. Um, and so, and not, not to mention that I'm also separated from my luggage, as well as having to hand the driver my credit card to pay my fare. Um, I'm riding at a very uncomfortable angle, and I have to enter and exit the vehicle from the street. So there's been a lot of strides in accessible vehicles. I don't want to take too much more of your time up today, because I know you've heard um, a lot of these points throughout the day. But the reason... Um, or I should say, I, I'm happy that there has been conversion vehicles and other accessible vehicles. Otherwise, we would not have any option to leave our homes all these years. But today, there is another option, and it's an OEM vehicle purpose-built from the factory that was built to, for this purpose. So that means it's durable, it's reliable, and it's going to stand up to um, what it's, it's meant to do, and it's safe. It's crash tested and it's the safest option out there and it's really raising the standard for accessible transportation. So um, as you can see, I'm pretty passionate about this and as a, a longtime wheelchair user, um, I didn't know if a vehicle like this would be available in my lifetime and I'm happy to say that um, today it is. So uh, thank you again for your time and, and I appreciate everything you guys are doing to, to hear us today. Next. Good afternoon uh, to the council for this stride in listening to your constituents in the five boroughs, the needs and the possibilities of making our lives as disabled persons living with challenges in this city much better. Thank you. I am a 54-year-old left under the knee amputee. I became disabled in 2011 on East 80th Street between York and East End, where I was struck by a vehicle and left for dead. Thankfully, I have a God that understands and heals. And with the progress of science, I'm here today speaking to you. One of my greatest concerns is a stressor ride. A stressor ride because when I started off as a disabled person, I was on no blood pressure medication. I have advanced from 10 MGs to 40 MGs in Novask as a result of a stressor ride. As recently as yesterday, I had an appointment at Kings County Hospital Center to visit my endocrinologist, and also to have an update on my limb. 
I had an appointment at 12.30 p.m. to be picked up for a 2 p.m. appointment. I left 45 Lafayette Street on the fifth floor and sat in the hallway at 12.25 p.m. I have something called call out and assist, which means 45 Lafayette is a one-way street and I cannot cross the street unattended. The driver needs to leave the vehicle and assist me to the car or to the bus or to whatever vehicle comes to pick me up. I was never called, I was never assisted, and I was put as a no-show. When I called dispatch through access a ride, I was given a 3.15 appointment for a 2 p.m. doctor's appointment. Walk in my shoes if you can. If I were a dog, ASPCA would have treated me better. If I were a horse, the horsemen would have treated me better. I am sure if you would ask the thousands of people who ride a stressor ride, they would give you volumes of stories. In between here and there, there are pearls of kindness, but the pearls are too far and few in between. We are paying for a service as upright citizens of this great country. After all, these are the United States of America that said to the world, send me your poor, your tired and your hungry. We've given life and limb to this great city and we expect nothing less than to be treated with dignity. I've been called every name in the book on a stressor ride. And the monopoly that the MTA has on the vehicles like Maggie and Premier and, and Star and all of the other capitalistic, money-grabbing, greedy and outrageous subcontractors in the MTA must stop. Disabled people must be treated at least with a semblance of dignity as we celebrate the 25th anniversary of the ADA. Thank you. Ma'am, you should be a motivational speaker. <laughs> um, good morning, uh, good afternoon. Uh, that was not an intentional joke. Um, I accidentally read my testimony. Um, good afternoon, my name is Michael O'Loughlin. I speak today on behalf of Cab Riders United. Uh, we're an organization that um, tries to provide a public voice on behalf of the passengers of New York City's taxis, 1.2 million a day, taxis and four hire vehicles. Uh, our three-part agenda is to improve the safety, the quality of service, and the environmental impact of the taxi and four hire vehicle industry. Um, we appreciate the council holding this hearing today, and <clears throat> this is, I, I, these are crazy issues, and I really hope that you can make some progress on them. While most of what I'm going to say is focused on the taxi and for hire vehicle sector, um, I do hope that it may also be uh, helpful in addressing some of the accessoride and DIFTA issues as they come up. A um, few general principles we probably all share, safety uh, and environmental health. Um, as we strive to achieve the goals of Vision Zero, uh, the mayor's 80 by 50 uh, greenhouse gas reductions commitment, uh, the air quality goals of uh, one NYC, um, policy decisions need to prioritize the safety of those inside the vehicle, both passengers and drivers, um, whether ambulatory or in a wheelchair, and also the safety and the environmental health of the New Yorkers outside the vehicle, those with whom we share our streets and our air. All New Yorkers in every borough um, uh, should be treated equally, whether they are disabled or ambulatory. And while we advance toward the goal of 100% accessibility and universal design, we've got to be really careful to get this right and to do it in a way that doesn't compromise some of our other principles. Um, here's my concern in part. Poor quality wave wheelchair accessible vehicle conversions um, uh, can cause vehicles to deteriorate early, before their expected retirement age, uh, creating potentially unsafe conditions for the passengers and financial hardship for the uh, drivers or owners. Um, that is a recipe for um, losing support for the city's commitment to 50% wheelchair accessibility. Um, <clears throat> The temptation of, of, uh, of inexperienced wave operators is going to be to purchase low-cost conversions um, that break down over time. 
Um, let me quickly run through some specific issues uh, we would urge uh, you and the TLC to uh, consider. Um, safety. National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, the Federal v Motor Vehicle Safety Standards. Every vehicle licensed as a taxi or for hire vehicle in New York should meet those standards. To my knowledge, there are two that do that today uh, that, that can be wheelchair accessible. That is the MV1 and the NV200. Um, those have both been crash tested as outfitted for use as taxis. Um, some of the um, uh, um, uh, issues that we see in, in low quality uh, conversions, um, <clears throat> non-OEM seats or belts, alterations to the vehicle frame that can create structural problems. Um, there are a lot of things to admire about the uh, MV1 in terms of uh, safety, um, but one of them is not airbags. Um, NHTSA recommends airbags. The MV1, in fact, only has a, pass, a, a driver airbag. There are no airbags for passengers. Oh, it is. Okay, that's great. That's, that's good to know. Um, uh, secondly, uh, in terms of uh, rear entry or side entry, um, we've heard sincere arguments for both. Uh, I recently heard the TLC commissioner make the point that in the 10 years or so since wheelchair accessible vehicles first started being used as taxis in New York, no one has actually been, uh, that she knows of, has been injured. Uh, hit in traffic while entering a rear entry vehicle, so that should also be part of the record. Um, safety outside of the vehicle. Um, in the United States, we don't have pedestrian impact standards. Most of the world does. Um, but vehicles that are licensed for use as taxis in a pedestrian rich environment like New York should meet the global standards for pedestrian impact to protect people because people do get hit by taxis all the time. Likewise, bicycles, one of the things that they actually did get right on the taxi of tomorrow was the sliding door. Um, dooring is, in fact, the leading cause of injury to bicyclists in New York. That's a real issue. Um, <clears throat> ADA compliance. Um, uh, I'll submit my written testimony um, to cover some of these points in more detail. Um, uh, it is important to note, though, that um, there are vehicles on the street right now being used as waves, uh, wave taxis that have disturbing um, uh, features. We've seen some that lack interior quick release handles for use in case of an emergency. Um, we've seen others that have been equipped with a flammable rubber matting. Um, <clears throat> uh, emissions and fuel economy. Again, there are some things that are really admirable about the MV1. One of them is not um, what it brings to the environment. It's very fuel inefficient um, and emits a lot of greenhouse gases. Um, unfortunately. Uh, a last point, this is uh, take your child to work day. And so let me urge the council to consider one other accessibility issue. Um, children, we need to figure out a better and safer way to transport children in for hire vehicles in New York. Um, thank you for your time and attention to these issues. Thank you. Next. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair uh, Chin and uh, Chair Co Co uh, Cohen. It's good to see you. Nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Michael McMahon, and I am here on behalf of Nissan North America, uh, the maker of the NV200 and the uh, NV200 Wave. Uh, and I presented to you with my testimony some fact sheets that were prepared by uh, our partner in the conversion, the company by the name of Braun. Uh, from Indiana, and they have uh, provided to you comparisons uh, between our vehicle and the MV1, which you've heard a lot about today, as well as uh, clearly dispelling some of the things that were said before about our vehicle not being uh, ADA compliant uh, and uh, about its measurements uh, and how it functions uh, in the converted state. It's not easy to present factual uh, arguments uh, in the light of very compelling emotional uh, arguments that have been made here today, but I urge this committee to consider the facts uh, of the vehicles uh, and the process that brought the NV200 uh, and the wave to the city of New York. As I'm sure you're aware, this vehicle wasn't designed by Nissan in a factory by itself. It was done in consultation with various stakeholders that were identified by the City of New York over a multi-year process. And part of that process was to build a vehicle that could serve the most amount of New Yorkers uh, from one vehicle platform. 
And so what you have before you is a vehicle that can really achieve many of the goals that this council strives to do at this accessor ride hearing, which is to have a vehicle uh, that serves many uh, uh, accessibility needs as well as can help this committee bring down the cost uh, of the accessor ride uh, program. Um, some of the, some of the uh, features of our vehicle that I'd just like to highlight uh, for you is that every Nissan vehicle, uh, this is pre-conversion, every vehicle has braille enhanced signage uh, for the sight impaired and extra floor space for companion animals. Every Nissan vehicle has a hearing loop and additional lighting and seat piping with contrasting colors, again, for visual impairment and to help with that. The NV200 is the only vehicle that is manufactured on the assembly line uh, conversion ready. The floor is not lowered. It is built in a way that the conversion can happen in consultation with the company Braun. And it has factory installed uh, steel partitions that are crash tested. The MV1, no other vehicle has a partition that is crash tested as well. And as you heard, it's very important uh, about airbags. Um, it's news to me, but according to the experts, uh, the only vehicle that has airbags in the back for uh, those with the wheelchairs uh, is the NV200. Uh, I would also submit that the rear entry feature provides a reasonable approach to access given the context of New York City. And as you see in the documents I submitted prepared by Braun, uh, they consider it reasonable in the context of New York City giving one-way streets, given limited access uh, to curbside, and the rear entry can be along the curbside, but it has other features as well, as borne out in the diagrams that are submitted uh, there. And then, as was mentioned uh, in the fact sheet comparison between the vehicles, uh, when it comes to emissions, fuel economy, the cost of operating the vehicle, you know, the owners and operators of the yellow taxis are under uh, financial pressure. Our vehicle presents, if you will, uh, the whole package. Uh, and I think it's quite clear that our vehicle is the most effective tool as designed in cooperation with the City of New York uh, to meet all the needs uh, of the most New Yorkers. Um, and I'd love to have any questions if you have them. Uh, I think the question probably is best answered by the, uh, the writer advocate. In terms of, you, you mentioned uh, inferior conversions. Uh, do you think that there are acceptable conversions, or do you think co that converting existing vehicles is not really a tenable way? Yeah, I, I mean, I think I would point, for example, uh, to the vehicle on my right and the vehicle on my left, um, both of which are designed to be wheelchair accessible um, or made wheelchair accessible. Um, there are standards that should be in place. Um, uh, it's similar in a way to actually the partition issue, right? For decades, we've been improvising partitions in the backs of taxis. Um, and that actually compromises the structural integrity and the safety of the taxi. It creates a, a fresh uh, impact hazard for people with faces or heads who are riding in the back of a taxi. Um, the wheelchair uh, uh, conversions shouldn't compromise the structural integrity of a vehicle. Um, they should uh, be respectful of the passenger's uh, safety. Um, they should make sure that um, the materials used are safe. The idea that there are vehicles that don't include an emergency escape latch is frankly disturbing. Um, the, one of the issues that uh, come up uh, is the um, storage of the latches. Um, and that should be done in a way that, um, that they don't get lost, they don't get filthy dirty, you know, floating around in the back of the taxi. Um, and uh, shoot, I had one more I was going to give you. But I've... I just want to add one other thing that's been said here today, that in the NV200 wave that the rider sits in the back, I know one of the prior test speakers said, with the luggage. That's absolutely incorrect. As you see in the diagram, the seat, uh, the bench, the main bench rolls all the way forward, and the chair sits in exactly the same position as that bench had been in. So it is in the same position that the bench rider is in. It's not in the back of the vehicle. Thank you for your testimony. Um, thank you very much uh, for coming in today. Is anyone else that would like to testify? Uh, you will have to fill out a slip. No? Well, thank you all for being here today. Uh, the hearing is adjourned. Thank you.